Chapter 1 of The Crack of Doom This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Crack of Doom by Robert Cromie Chapter 1 The Universe A Mistake The Universe is a Mistake Thus spake Herbert Brand, a passenger on the Majestic making for Queenstown Harbor, one evening early in the past year. Foolish as the words may seem, they were partly influential in leading to my terrible association with him and all that is described in this book. Brand was standing beside me on the starboard side of the vessel. We had been discussing a current astronomical essay as we watched the hazy blue line of the Irish coast rise on the horizon. This conversation was interrupted by Brand, who said impatiently, Why tell us of stars distant so far from this insignificant little world of ours? So insignificant that even its own inhabitants speak disrespectfully of it, that it would take hundreds of years to telegraph to some of them, thousands to others, and millions to the rest. Why limit oneself to a mere million of years for a dramatic illustration when there is a star in space distant so far from us that if a telegram left the Earth for it this very night and maintained forever its initial velocity, it would never reach that star? He said this without any apparent effort after rhetorical effect, but the suddenness with which he had presented a very obvious truism in a fresh light to me made the conception of the vastness of space absolutely oppressive. In the hope of changing the subject, I replied, Nothing is gained by dwelling on these scientific speculations. The mind is only bewildered. The universe is inexplicable. The universe, he exclaimed. That is easily explained. The universe is a mistake. The greatest mistake of the century, I suppose, I added, somewhat annoyed for I thought Brand was laughing at me. Say of time, and I agree with you, he replied, careless of my astonishment. I did not answer him for some moments. This man Brand was young in years, but middle-aged in the expression of his pale intellectual face, and old, if age be synonymous with knowledge, in his ideas. His knowledge, indeed, was so exhaustive that the scientific pleasantries to which he was prone could always be justified, dialectically at least, by him when he was contradicted. Those who knew him well did not argue with him. I was always stumbling into intellectual pitfalls, for I had only known him since the steamer left New York. As to myself, there is little to be told. My history prior to my acquaintance with Brand was commonplace. I was merely an active, athletic Englishman, Arthur Marcel by name. I had studied medicine and was a doctor in all but the degree. This certificate had been dispensed with owing to an unexpected legacy, on receipt of which I determined to devote it to the furtherance of my own amusement. In the pursuit of this object, I had visited many lands and had become familiar with most of the beaten tracks of travel. I was returning to England after an absence of three years spent in aimless roaming. My age was thirty-one years, and my salient characteristic at the time was to hold fast by anything that interested me until my humor changed. Brand's conversational vagaries had amused me on the voyage. His extraordinary comment on the universe decided me to cement our shipboard acquaintance before reaching port. That explanation of yours, I said, lighting a fresh cigar and returning to a subject which I had so recently tried to shelve. Isn't it rather vague? For the present, it must serve, he answered absently. To force him into admitting that his phrase was only a thoughtless exclamation, or induce him to defend it, I said, It doesn't serve any reasonable purpose. It adds nothing to knowledge. As it stands, it is neither academic nor practical. Bran looked at me earnestly for a moment, and then said gravely, the academic value of the explanation will be shown to you 
if you will join a society I have founded, and its practicalness will soon be made plain whether you join or not. What do you call this club of yours? I asked. We do not call it a club. We call it a society. The Qui Bono Society, he answered coldly. I like the name, I returned. It is suggestive. It may mean anything or nothing. You will learn later that the society means something, a good deal, in fact. This was said in the dry, unemotional tone, which I afterwards found was the only sign of displeasure Brand ever permitted himself to show. His arrangements for going on shore at Queenstown had been made early in the day, but he left me to look for his sister, of whom I had seen very little on the voyage. The weather had been rough, and as she was not a good sailor, I had only a rare glimpse of a very dark and handsome girl whose society possessed me for a strange attraction, although we were then almost strangers. Indeed, I regretted keenly as the time of our separation approached, having registered my luggage, consisting largely of curios and mementos of my travels, of which I was very careful, for Liverpool. My own time was valueless, and it would have been more agreeable to me to continue the journey with the brands, no matter where they went. There was a choppy sea on when we reached the entrance to the harbor, so the Majestic steamed in between the Carlisle and Camden forts and on to the man-of-war roads where the tender met us. By this time, Brand and his sister were ready to go on shore, but as there was a heavy mail to be transhipped, we still had an hour at our disposal. For some time, we paced the deck, exchanging commonplaces on the voyage and confidences as to our future plans. It was almost dark, but not dark enough to prevent us from seeing those wonderfully green hills which landlocked the harbor. To me, the verdant woods and hills were delightful after the brown plains and interminable prairies on which I had spent many months. As the lights of Queenstown began to speck the slowly gathering gloom, Miss Brand asked me to point out Rostellan Castle. It could not be seen from the vessel, but the familiar legend was easily recalled, and this led us to talk about Irish tradition with its weird romance and never-failing pathos. This interested her. Freed now from the lassitude of seasickness, the girl became more fascinating to me every moment. Everything she said was worth listening to, apart from the charming manner in which it was said. To declare that she was an extremely pretty girl would not convey the strange almost unearthly beauty of her face, as intellectual as her brother's, and of the charm of her slight but exquisitely molded figure. In her dark eyes there was a sympathy, a compassion that was new to me. It thrilled me with an emotion different from anything that my frankly happy but hitherto wholly selfish life had known. There was only one note in her conversation which jarred upon me. She was apt to drift into the extraordinary views of life and death, which were interesting when formulated by her eccentric brother, but pained me coming from her lips. In spite of this, the purpose I had contemplated of joining Brand's society, evoked as it had been by his own whimsical observation, now took definite form. I would join that society. It would be the best way of keeping near to Natalie Brand. Her brother returned to us to say that the tender was about to leave the ship. He had left us for half an hour. I did not notice his absence until he himself announced it. As we shook hands, I said to him, I have been thinking about that society of yours. I mean to join it. I am very glad, he replied. You will find it a new sensation, quite outside the beaten track, which you know so well. There was a shade of half-kindly contempt in his voice, which missed me at the moment. I answered gaily, knowing that he would not be offended by what was said in jest. I'm sure I shall. If all the members are as mad as yourself, it will be the most interesting experience outside Bedlam that any man could wish for. I had a foretaste of that interest soon. As Miss Brand was walking to the gangway, a lamp shone full upon her gypsy face. 
the blue-black hair, the dark eyes, and a deep red rose she wore in her bonnet seemed to me an exquisite arrangement of harmonious color. And the thought flashed into my mind very vividly, however trivial it may seem here, when written down in cold words, the queen of women and the queen of flowers. That is not precisely how my thought ran, but I cannot describe it better. The finer subtleties of the brain do not bear well the daylight of language. Bran drew her back and whispered to her. Then the sweet face, now slightly flushed, was turned to me again. Oh, thank you for that pretty thought, she said with a pleasant smile. You are too flattering. The queen of flowers is very true, but the queen of women, oh, no. She made a graceful gesture of dissent and passed down the gangway. As the tender disappeared into the darkness, a tiny scrap of lace waved, and I knew vaguely that she was thinking of me. But how she read my thought so exactly, I could not tell. That knowledge it has been my fate to gain. End of chapter one. Read by Paul Hampton. Chapter 2 of The Crack of Doom This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Crack of Doom by Robert Cromey Chapter 2 A Strange Experiment Soon after my arrival in London, I called upon Brand at the address he had given me in Brook Street. He received me with the pleasant affability of which a man of the world easily assumes, and his apology for being unable to pass the evening with me in his own house was a model of social style. The difficulty in the way was practically an impossibility. His society had a meeting on that evening, and it was imperative that he should be present. Why not come yourself, he said. It is what we might call a guest night, that is, Visitors, if friends of members are admitted, and as this privilege may not be again accorded to outsiders, you ought to come before you decide finally to join us. I must go now, but Natalie, he did not say Miss Brand, will entertain you and bring you to the hall. It is very near, in Hanover Square. I shall be very glad indeed to bring Miss Brand to the hall, I answered, changing the sentence in order to correct Brand's too patronizing phrase. The same thing, in different words, is it not? If you prefer it that way, please have it so. His imperturbability was unaffected. Miss Brand here entered the room. Her brother, with a word of renewed apology, left us, and presently I saw him cross the street and hail a passing hand. You must not blame him for running off, Miss Brand said. He has much to think of, and the society depends almost wholly on himself. I stammered out that I did not blame him at all, and indeed my disclaimer was absolutely true. Bran could not have pleased me better than he had done by relieving us of his company. Miss Bran made tea, which I pretended to enjoy in the hope of pleasing her. Over this we talked more like old and well-proven friends than mere acquaintances of ten days' standing. Just once or twice the mysterious chord which marred the girl's charming conversation was touched. She immediately changed the subject on observing my distress. I say distress, for a weaker word would not fittingly describe the emotion I felt whenever she blundered into the pseudo-scientific nonsense, which was her brother's favorite affectation. At least, it seemed nonsense to me. I could not well foresee, then, that the theses which appeared to be mere theoretical absurdities would ever be proven, as they have been. Very terrible realities. On subjects of ordinary educational interest, my hostess displayed such full knowledge of the question and ease in dealing with it that I listened, fascinated, as long as she chose to continue speaking. It was a novel and delightful experience to hear a girl as handsome as a pictorial masterpiece and dressed like a court beauty discourse with the knowledge 
and in the language of the oldest philosopher. But this was only one of the many surprising combinations in her complex personality. My novitiate was still in its first stage. The time to set out for the meeting arrived all too soon for my inclination. We decided to walk, the evening being fine and not too warm, and the distance only a ten-minute stroll. At a street crossing, we met a crowd unusually large for that neighborhood. Miss Brand again surprised me. She was watching the crowd seething and swarming past. Her dark eyes followed the people with a strange wonder, pitying look, which I did not understand. Her face, exquisite in its expression at all times, was now absolutely transformed, beatified. Brand had often spoken to me of mesmerism, clairvoyance, and similar subjects, and it occurred to me that he had used his sister as a medium, a clairvoyant. Her brain was not, therefore, under normal control. I determined instantly to tell him on the first opportunity that if he did not wish to see the girl permanently injured, he would have to curtail his hypnotic influence. It is rather a stirring sight, I said so sharply to Miss Brand that she started. I meant to startle her, but did not succeed as far as I wished. It is a very terrible sight, she answered. Oh, there is no danger, I said hastily and drew her hand over my arm. Danger? I was not thinking of danger. As she did not remove her hand, I did not infringe the silence which followed this until a break in the traffic allowed us to cross the street. Then I said, May I ask what you were thinking of just now, Miss Brand? Of the people, their lives, their work, their misery? I assure you, many are very happy, I replied. You take a morbid view. Misery is not the rule. I'm sure the majority are happy. What difference does that make? The girl said with a sigh. What is the end of it all? The meaning of it all? Their happiness? Cubone? We walked along in silence while I turned over in my mind what she had said. I could come to no conclusion upon it, save that my dislike for her enigmatic aberrations was becoming more intense as my liking for the girl herself increased. To change the current of her thoughts and my own, I asked her abruptly, are you a member of the Cubono Society? I? Oh, no. Women are not allowed to join, for the present. I am delighted to hear it, I said heartily, and I hope the rule will continue in force. She looked at me in surprise. Why should you mind? You are joining yourself. That is different. I don't approve of ladies mixing themselves up in these curious and perhaps questionable societies. My remark amused her. Her eyes sparkled with simple fun. The change in her manner was very agreeable to me. I might have expected that. To my extreme satisfaction, she now looked almost mischievous. Herbert told me you were a little... A little what? Well, a little... You won't be vexed? That is right. He said, a little... Medieval. This abated my appreciation of her sense of humor, and I maintained a dignified reticence, which unhappily she regarded as mere sullenness, until we reached the society's room. The place was well filled, and the company, in spite of the extravagantly modern costumes of the younger women, which I cannot describe better than saying that there was little difference in it from that of ordinary male attire, was quite conventional insofar as the interchange of ordinary courtesies went. When, however, any member of the society mingled with a group of visitors, the conversation was soon turned into a new channel. Secrets of science, which I had been accustomed to look upon as undiscoverable, were bandied about like the merest commonplaces of education. The absurdity of individuality and the subjectivity of the emotions were alike insisted on without notice of the paradox, which to me appeared extreme. The associates were altruistic for the sake of altruism, not for the sake of its beneficiaries. They were not pantheists, for they saw neither universal good nor God, but rather evil in all things, themselves included. Their talk, however, 
was brilliant, and with allowance for its jarring sediments, it possessed something of the indefinable charm which followed Bran. My reflections on this identity of interest were interrupted by the man himself. After a word of welcome, he said, Let me show you our great experiment, that which touches the high water mark of scientific achievement in the history of humanity. It is not much in itself, but it is the pioneer of many marvels. He brought me to a metal stand on which a small instrument constructed of some white metal was placed. A large number of wires were connected with various portions of it, and these wires passed into the sidewall of the building. In appearance, this marvel of micrology, so far as the eyepiece and upper portions went, was like an ordinary microscope, but its magnifying power was to me unbelievable. It magnified the object under examination many thousand times more than the most powerful microscope in the world. I looked through the upper lens and saw a small globe suspended in the middle of a tiny chamber filled with soft blue light, or transparent material. Circling around this globe, four other spheres revolved in orbits, some almost circular, some elliptical, some parabolic. As I looked, Bran touched a key, and the little globules began to fly more rapidly around their primary and make wider sweeps in their revolutions. Another key was pressed, and the revolving sphere slowed down and drew closer until I could scarcely distinguish any movement. The globules seemed to form a solid ball. Attend now, Bran exclaimed. He tapped the first key sharply, a little gray cloud obscured the blue light. When it cleared away, the revolving globes had disappeared. What do you think of it? He asked carelessly. What is it? What does it mean? Is it the solar system or some other system illustrated in miniature? I am sorry for the misadventure. You are partly correct, Bran replied. It is an illustration of a planetary system, though a small one but there was no misadventure. I caused the somewhat dangerous result you witnessed, the wreckage not merely of the molecule of marsh gas you were examining, which any educated chemist might do as easily as I, but the wreckage of its constituent atoms. This is a scientific victory which dwarfs the work of Hemholtz, Avogadro, or Mendeleev, the immortal Dalton himself. The word immortal was spoken with a sneer might rise from his grave to witness it. Atoms? Molecules? What are you talking about? I asked, bewildered. You were looking on at the death of a molecule, a molecule of marsh gas, as I have already said. It was caused by a process which I would describe to you if I could reduce my own life work and that of every scientific amateur who has preceded me since the world began into half a dozen sentences. As that would be difficult, I must ask you to accept my personal assurance that you witnessed a fact, not a fiction of my imagination. And your instrument is so perfect that it not only renders molecules and atoms, but their diffusion visible? It is a microscopic impossibility. At least it is amazing. Pshaw! Brand exclaimed impatiently. My instrument does certainly magnify to a marvelous extent but not by the old device of the simple microscope, which merely focused a large area of light rays into a small one. So crude a process could never show an atom to the human eye. I add much to that. I restore to the rays themselves the luminosity which they lost in their passage through our atmosphere. I give them back all their visual properties and turn them with their full etheric blaze on this object under examination. Great as that achievement is, I deny that it is amazing. It may amaze a Papuan to see his eyelash magnified to the size of a wire, or an uneducated Englishman to see a cheese mite magnified to the size of a midge. It should not amaze you to see a simple process a little further developed. Where does the danger you spoke of come in? I asked with a pretense of interest. Candidly, I did not believe a single word that Brand had said. If you will consult a common textbook on the physics of the ether, he replied, 
you will find that one grain of matter contains sufficient energy, if etherized, to raise a hundred thousand tons nearly two miles. In face of such potentiality, it is not wise to wreck incautiously even the atoms of a molecule. And the limits to this description of scientific experiment? Where are they? There are no limits, Rand said decisively. No man can say to science, thus far and no farther. No man has ever been able to do so. No man ever shall. End of chapter 2 Read by Paul Hampton Chapter 3 of The Crack of Doom This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tom Freya. The Crack of Doom by Robert Cromie. Chapter 3 It is Good to Be Alive. Among the letters lying on my breakfast table a few days after the meeting was one addressed in an unfamiliar hand. The writing was bold and formed like a man's. There was a faint trace of a perfume about the envelope, which I remembered. I opened it first. It was, as I expected, from Miss Brand. Her brother had gone to their country place in the southern coast. She and her friend Edith Metford were going that day. Their luggage was already at the station. Would I send on what I required for a short visit and meet them at eleven o'clock on the bridge over the Serpentine? It was enough for me. I packed a large portmanteau hastily, sent it to Charing Cross, and spent the time at my disposal in the park, which was close to my hotel. Although the invitation I had received gave me pleasure, I could not altogether remove from my mind a sense of disquietude concerning Herbert Brand and his society. The advanced opinions I had heard, if extreme, were not altogether alarming, but the mysterious way in which Brand himself had spoken about the society, and the still more mysterious air which some of the members assumed when directly questioned as to its object, suggested much. Might it not be a revolutionary party engaged in a grave intrigue, a branch of some foreign body whose purpose was so dangerous that ordinary disguises were not considered sufficiently secure? Might they not have adopted the jargon and pretended to the opinions of scientific faddists as a cloak for designs more sinister and sincere? The experiment I witnessed might be almost a miracle or merely a trick. Thinking it over thus, I could come to no final opinion, and when I asked myself aloud, What are you afraid of? I could not answer my own question, but I thought I would defer joining the society pending further information. A few minutes before eleven, I walked toward the bridge over the Serpentine. No ladies appeared to be on it, there were only a couple of smartly dressed youths there, one smoking a cigarette. I sauntered about until one of the lads, the one who was not smoking, looked up and beckoned to me. I approached leisurely, for it struck me that the boy would have shown better breeding if he had come toward me, considering my seniority. I am sorry I did not notice you sooner. Why did you not come on when you saw us? the smallest and slimmest youth called to me. In the name of, uh, Miss, uh, Miss, I stammered. Brand, you haven't forgotten my name, I hope. Natalie Brand said coolly, This is my friend Edith Metford. Metford, this is Arthur Marcel. How do you do, Marcel? I am glad to meet you. I have heard favorable mention of you from the Brands. The second figure in Knickerbocker said pleasantly, How do you do, sir, madam, I mean, miss? I blundered, and then in despair I asked Miss Brand, Is this a tableau vivant? What is the meaning of these disguises? 
My embarrassment was so great that my discourteous question may be pardoned. Our dress? Surely you have seen women rationally dressed before? Miss Brand answered complacently, while the other girl watched my astonishment with evident amusement. This second girl, Edith Metford, was a frank, handsome young woman, but unlike the spiritual beauty of Natalie Brand. She was perfectly taller than her friend, and of fuller figure. In consequence, she looked, in my opinion, to even less advantage in her eccentric costume, or rational dress, than did Miss Brand. Rationally dressed, oh yes, I know, the divided skirt, but— Miss Medford interrupted me. Do you recall the divided skirt atrocity, rational dress? She asked pointedly. Upon my honor I do not, I answered. These girls were too advanced in their ideas of dress for me, nor did I feel at all at my ease during this conversation, which did not, however, appear to embarrass them. I proposed hastily to get a cab, but they demurred. It was such a lovely day, they preferred to walk, part of the way at least. I pointed out that there might be drawbacks to this amendment of my proposal. What drawbacks? Miss Medford asked. For instance, isn't it possible we shall all be arrested by the police? I replied. Rubbish! We're not in Russia! Both exclaimed. Which is lucky for you, I reflected, as we commenced what was to me a most disagreeable walk. I got them into a cab sooner than they wished. At the railway station I did not offer to procure their tickets. To do so, I felt, would only give offense. Critical glances followed us as we went to our carriage. Londoners are becoming accustomed to varieties, if not vagaries, in ladies' costumes. But the dress of my friends was evidently a little out of the common even for them. Miss Metford was just turning the handle of a carriage door when I interposed, saying, This is a smoking compartment. So I see. I am going to smoke, if you don't object. I don't suppose it would make any difference if I did, I said, with unconscious asperity, for indeed this excess of free manners was jarring upon me. The line dividing it from vulgarity was becoming so thin I was losing sight of the divisor. Yet no one, even the most fastidious, could associate vulgarity with Natalie Brand. There remained an air of unassumed sincerity about herself and all her actions including even her dress, which absolutely excluded her from hostile criticism. I could not, however, extend that lenient judgment to Miss Metford. The girls spoke and acted, as they had dressed themselves, very much alike. Although what seemed to me in the one a natural eccentricity seemed in the other an unnatural affectation. I saw the guard passing and calling him over, gave him half a crown to have the compartment labeled engaged. Miss Brand, who had been looking out of the window, absently asked my reason for this precaution. I replied that I wanted the compartment reserved for ourselves. I certainly did not want any staring and otherwise offensive fellow passengers. We don't want all the seats, she persisted. No, I admitted. We don't want the extra seats, but I thought you might like the privacy. The desire for privacy is an archaic emotion. Miss Medford remarked sensuously, as she struck a match. Besides, it is so selfish. We may be crowding others, Miss Brand said quietly. I was glad she did not smoke. I don't want that now, I said to a porter, who was hurrying up with a label. To the girls I remarked a little snappishly, Of course you are quite right. You must excuse my ignorance. No, it is not ignorance. Miss Brand demurred. You have been away so much. You have hardly been in England. You told me. For years, and— And progress has been marching in my absence, I interrupted. So it seems, Miss Medford remarked so significantly that I really could not help retorting with as much emphasis, compatible with politeness, as I could command. You see, I am therefore unable to appreciate the new woman— of whom I have heard so much since I came home. 
the conventional new woman is a grandmotherly old fossil, Miss Medford said quietly. This disposed of me. I leaned back in my seat and was rigidly silent. Miles of green fields stippled with daisies and bordered with long lines of white and red hawthorn hedges flew past. The smell of new-mown hay filled the carriage with its sweet perfume, redolent of old associations. My long absence dwindled to a short holiday. The world's wide highways were far off. I was back in the English fields. My slight annoyance passed away. I fell into a pleasant daydream, which was broken by a soft voice, every undulation of which I already knew by heart. I am afraid you think us very advanced, it murmured. Very, I agreed, but I look to you to bring even me up to date. Oh, yes, we mean to do that, but we must proceed very gradually. You have made an excellent start, I put in. Otherwise, you would only be shocked. It is quite possible, I said this with so much conviction, that the two burst out laughing at me. I could not think of anything more to add, and I felt relieved when, with a warning shriek, the train dashed into a tunnel. By the time we had emerged again into the sunlight and the solitude of the open landscape, I had ready an impromptu, which I had been working at in the darkness. I looked straight at Miss Metford and said, After all, it is very pleasant to travel with girls like you. Thank you. You did not show any hysterical fear of my kissing you in the tunnel. Why the deuce would you do that? Miss Metford replied with great composure as she blew a smoke ring. When we reached our destination I braced myself for another disagreeable minute or two, for if the great Londoners thought us quaint, surely the little country station idlers would swear we were demented. We crossed the platform so quickly that the wonderment we created soon passed. Our luggage was looked after by a servant, to whose care I confided it with a very brief description. The loss of an item of it did not seem to me of as much importance as our own immediate departure. Bran met us at his hall door. His house was a pleasant one, covered with flowering, creeping plants, and surrounded by miniature forests. In front there was a lake four hundred yards in width. Close-shaven lawns bordered it. They were artificial products, no doubt, but they were artificial successes, undulating, earth-scented, fresh-rolled every morning. Here there was an isolated shrub, there a thick bank of rhododendrons, and the buds, bursting into floral carnival, promised fine contrasts when their full splendor was come. The lake wavelets tinkled musically on a pebbly beach. Our host could not entertain us in person. He was busy. The plea was evidently sincere, notwithstanding that the business of a country gentleman, which he now seemed to be, is something less exacting than busy people's leisure. After a short rest and an admirably served lunch, we were dismissed to the woods for our better amusement. Thereafter followed for me a strangely peaceful, idyllic day, all save its ending. Looking back on it, I know that the sun which set that evening went down on the last of my happiness, but it all seems trivial now. My companions were accomplished botanists, and here, for the first time, I found myself on common ground with both. We discussed every familiar wildflower as eagerly as if we had been professed field naturalists. In walking or climbing my assistance was neither requisitioned nor required. I did not offer, therefore, what must have been unwelcome when it was superfluous. We rested at least under the shade of a big beech, for the afternoon sun was rather oppressive. It was a pleasant spot to while away an hour. A purling brook went babbling by, singing to itself as it journeyed to the sea. Insects droned about in busy flight. There was a perfume of honeysuckle wafted to us on the summer wind, which stirred the beech tree and rustled its young leaves lazily so that the sunlight peeped through the green latticework and shone on the faces of these two handsome girls, 
stretched in graceful postures on the cool sward below, their white teeth sparkling in its brilliance, while their soft laughter made music for me. In the fullness of my heart, I said aloud, It is a good thing to be alive. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 Of The Crack of Doom This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tom Freya The Crack of Doom by Robert Cromey Chapter 4 George Delaney, Deceased It is a good thing to be alive, Natalie Brand repeated slowly, gazing, as it were, far off through her half-closed eyelids. Then, turning to me and looking at me full, wide-eyed, she asked, A good thing for how many? For all, for everything that is alive. For, for few things that are alive, for hardly anything. You say it is a good thing to be alive. How often have you said that in your life? All my life through, I answered stoutly. My constitution was a good one, and I had lived healthily, if heartily. I voiced the superfluous vitality of a well-nourished body. Then you do not know what it is to feel for others. There was a scream in the underwood near us. It ended in a short choking squeak. The girl paled, but she went on with her outward calm. That hawk or cat feels as you do. I wonder what that young rabbit thinks of life's problem. But we are neither hawks nor cats, nor even young rabbits. I answered warmly. We cannot bear the burdens of the whole animal world. Our own are sufficient for us. You are right. They are more than sufficient. I made a false move, and so tried to recover my lost ground. She would not permit me. The conversation which had run in pleasant channels for two happy hours was ended. Therefore, in spite of my obstructive efforts, Subjects were introduced which could not be conversed on, but must be discussed. On every one Miss Brand took the part of the weak against the strong, oblivious of every consideration of policy and even ethics, careful only that she championed the weak because of their weakness. Miss Metford abetted her in this, and went further in their joint revolt against common sense. Miss Brand was argumentative, pleading, Miss Metford was defiant. Between the two, I fared ill. Of course the woman question was soon introduced, and in this I made the best defense of time-honored customs of which I was capable. But my outworks fell down as promptly before the voices of these young women as did the walls of Jericho before the blast of a ram's horn. Nothing that I had cherished was left to me. Woman no longer wanted man's protection. Enslavement, they called it. Why should she, when in the evolution of society there was not now, nor presently would not be, anything from which to protect her? Competing slave owners was what they said. When you wish to behold protectors, you must postulate dangers. The first are valueless save as a preventative of the second. Both evils will be conveniently dispensed with. All this was new to me most of my thinking life having been passed in distant lands, where the science of ethics is codified into a simple statute, the will of the strongest. When my dialectical humiliation was within one point of completion, Miss Metford came to my rescue. For some time she had looked on at my discomfiture with a good-natured neutrality, and when I was metaphorically in my last ditch, she arose, stretched her shapely figure, flicked some clinging grass blades from her suit, and declared it was time to return. Bran was a man of science, but as such he was still amenable to the punctuality in the matter of dinner. On the way back I was discreetly silent. When we reached the house I went to look for Herbert Brand. He was engaged in his study, and I could not intrude upon him there. 
To do so would be to infringe the only rigid rule in his household. Nor had I an opportunity of speaking to him alone until after dinner, when I induced him to take a turn with me round the lake. I smoked strong cigars and made one of these my excuse. The sun was setting when we started, and as we walked slowly, the twilight shadows were deepening fast by the time we reached the farther shore. Bran was in high spirits. Some new scientific experiment, I assumed, had come off successfully. He was beside himself. His conversation was volcanic. Now it rumbled and roared with suppressed fires. Anon it burst forth in scintillating flashes and shot out streams of quickening wit. I have been his auditor in the three great epics of his life, but I do not think that anything that I have recollected of his utterances equals the bold impromptus, the masterly handling of his favorite subject, the universe, which fell from him on that evening. I could not answer him. I could not even follow him, much less suppress him. But I had come forth with a specific object in view, and I would not be gainsaid. And so, as my business had to be done better, that it should be done quickly. Taking advantage of a pause which he made, literally for breath, I commenced abruptly. I want to speak to you about your sister. He turned on me surprised. Then his look changed to one of such complete contempt, and with all his bearing suggested so plainly that he knew beforehand what I was going to say, that I blurted out defiantly and without stopping to choose my words. I think it is an infernal shame that you, her brother, should allow her to masquerade about with this good-natured but eccentric Metford girl. I should say, Miss Metford. Why so? he asked coldly. Because it is absurd, and because it isn't decent. My dear Abraham, Bran said quietly, or is your period so recent as that of Isaac or Jacob? My sister pleases herself in these matters, and has every right to do so. She has not. You are her brother. Very well. I am her brother. No right to live save by my permission. Then I graciously permit her to think, and I allow her to live. You'll be sorry for this nonsense sooner or later, and don't say I didn't warn you. The absolute futility of my last clause struck me painfully at the moment but I could not think of any way to better it. It was hard to reason with such a man, one who denied the fundamental principles of family life. I was thinking over what to say next, when Bran stepped and put his hand in a kindly way upon my shoulder. "'My good fellow,' he said, "'what does it matter? What do the actions of my sister signify more than the actions of any other man's sister?' And what about the society? Have you made up your mind about joining? I have. I made it up twice today, I answered. I made it up in the morning that I would see yourself and your society to the devil before I would join it. Excuse my business. But you are extremely candid yourself. You will not mind. Certainly. I do not mind bluntness. Rudeness is superfluous. And I made it up this evening, I said a little less aggressively, that I would join it if the devil himself were already in it, as I half suspect he is. I like that, Bran said gravely. That's the spirit I want in the man who joins me. To which I replied, What under the sun is the object of this society of yours? Approximately to complete our investigations, already far advanced, into the origin of the universe. And ultimately... I cannot tell you now. You will not know that until you join us. And if your ultimate object does not suit me, I can withdraw. No, it would then be too late. How so? I am not morally bound by an oath which I swear without full knowledge of its consequences and responsibilities. Oath! The oath you swear! You swear no oath! Do you fancy you are joining a society of Rechabites or Carmelites, or medieval rubbish of that kind? Don't keep so painstakingly behind the age. I thought for a moment over what this mysterious man had said, 
over the hidden dangers in which his mad chimeras might involve the most innocent accomplice. Then I thought of that dark-eyed, sweet-voiced young girl, as she lay on the green grass under the beech tree in the wood, and out-argued me on every point. Very suddenly, and perhaps in a manner somewhat grandiose, I answered him, I will join your society for my own purpose, and I will quit it when I choose. You have every right, Brand said carelessly. Many have done the same before you. Can you introduce me to anyone who has done so? I asked, with an eagerness that could not be dissembled. I'm afraid I cannot. Or give me an address? Oh, yes, that's simple. He turned over a notebook until he found a blank page. Then he drew the pencil from its loop, put the point to his lips, and paused. He was standing with his back to the failing light, so I could not see the expression of his mobile face. When he paused, I knew that no ordinary doubt beset him. He stood thus for nearly a minute. While he waited, I watched a pair of swans flit ghost-like over the silken surface of the lake. Between us and a dark bank of wood, the lights of the house flamed red. The melancholy evensong of a blackbird wailed out from a shrubbery beside us. Then Herbert Brand wrote in his notebook, and tearing out the page he handed it to me, saying, That is the address of the last man who quitted us. The light was now so dim I had to hold the paper close to my eyes in order to read the lines. They were these. George Delaney, near St. Anne's Chapel, Working Cemetery. End of chapter 4《Chapter 5 of The Crack of Doom》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To learn more, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tom Freya《The Crack of Doom》by Robert Cromie Chapter 5 — The Murder Club Delaney was the last man who quitted us. You see, I use your expression again. I like it, Bran said quietly, watching me as he spoke. I stood staring at the slip of paper which I held in my hand for some moments before I could reply. When my voice came back, I asked hoarsely, Did this man, Delaney, die suddenly after quitting the society? He died immediately. The second event was contemporaneous with the first. And in consequence of it? Certainly. Have all the members who retired from your list been equally short-lived? Without any exception whatever. Then your society, after all your high-flown talk about it, is only a vulgar murder club, I said bitterly. Wrong, in fact, and impertinent in its expression. It is not a murder club, and, well... You are the first to discover its vulgarity. I call things by their plain names. You may call your society what you please. As to my joining it in face of what you have told me, which is more than was ever told to any man before he joined, to any man living or dead, and more you need not join it yet unless you still wish to do so. I presume what I have said will prevent you. On the contrary, if I had any doubt or if there was any possibility of my wavering before this interview, there is none now. I join at once. He would have taken my hand, but that I could not permit. I left him without another word or any form of salute, and returned to the house. I did not appear again in the domestic circle that evening, for I had enough upon my mind without further burdening myself with social pretenses. I sat in my room and tried once more to consider my position. It was this. For the sake of a girl whom I had only met some score of times, who sometimes acted, talked, dressed, after a fashion suggestive of insanity, who had glorious dark eyes, a perfect figure, and an exquisitely beautiful face, but I interrupt myself. For the sake of this girl and for the manifestly impossible purpose of protecting her 
from herself as well as others. I had surrendered myself to the probable vengeance of a band of cutthroats if I betrayed them, and to the certain vengeance of the law if I did not. Brand, notwithstanding his constant skepticism, was scrupulously truthful. His statement of fact must be relied upon. His opinions were another matter. As nothing practical resulted from my reflections, I came to the conclusion that I had got into a pretty mess for the sake of a handsome face. I regretted this result, but was glad of the cause of it. On this I went to bed. Next morning I was early astir, for I must see Natalie Brand without delay, and I felt sure she would be no sluggard on that splendid summer day. I tried the lawn between the house and the lake shore. I did not find her there. I found her friend, Miss Metford. The girl was sauntering about, swinging a walking cane carelessly. She was still rationally dressed, but I observed with relief that the rational part of her costume was more in the nature of the divided skirt than the plain knickerbockers of the previous day. She accosted me cheerfully by my surname, and not to be outdone by her, I said coolly, "'How do you do, Metford?' "'Very well, thanks. I suppose you expected Natalie. You see you have only me.' Delighted, I was commencing with a forced smile when she stopped me. "'Look at it. But that can't be helped. Natalie saw you going out and sent me to meet you. I am to look after you for an hour or so. You join the society this evening, I hear. You must be very pleased and flattered. I could not assent to this, and so remained silent. The girl chattered on in her own outspoken manner, which now that I was growing accustomed to it, I did not find as unpleasant as at first. One thing was evident to me. She had no idea of the villainous nature of Brand's society. She could not have spoken so carelessly if she shared my knowledge of it. While she talked to me, I wondered if it was fair to her, a likable girl in spite of her undesirable affectations of advanced opinion, emancipation, or whatever she called it, was it fair to allow her to associate with a band of murderers, and not so much as whisper a word of warning? No doubt I myself was associating with the band, but I was not in ignorance of the responsibility thereby incurred. "'Miss Metford,' I said, without heeding whether I interrupted her, "'are you in the secret of this society?' "'I? Not at present.' I shall be later on. I stopped and faced her with so serious an expression that she listened to me attentively. If you will take my earnest advice, and I beg you not to neglect it, you will have nothing to do with it or anyone belonging to it. Not even Brand? I mean, Natalie? Is she dangerous? I disregarded her mischief and continued. If you can get Miss Brand away from her brother and his acquaintances... I had nearly said accomplices. And keep her away. You would be doing the best and kindest thing you ever did in your life. Miss Medford was evidently impressed by my seriousness, but, as she herself said very truly, it was unlikely that she would be able to interfere in the way I suggested. Besides, my mysterious warning was altogether too vague to be of any use as a guide for her own action, much less that of her friend. I dared not speak plainer. I could only repeat, in the most emphatic words, my anxiety that she would think carefully over what I had said. I then pretended to recollect an engagement with Brand, for I was in such low spirits I had really little taste for any company. She was disappointed, and said so in her usual straightforward way. It was not in the power of any gloomy prophecy to oppress her long. The serious look which my words had brought on her face passed quickly, and it was in her natural manner that she bade me good morning, saying, It is rather a bore, for I looked forward to a pleasant hour or two taking you about. I postponed my breakfast for one of appetite, and, as Brand's house was the best example of Liberty Hall I had ever met with, I offered no apology for my absence during the entire day when I rejoined my host and hostess in the evening. The interval I spent in the woods, thinking much and deciding nothing. 
After dinner, Brand introduced me to a man whom he called Edward Gray. Natalie conducted me to the room in which they were engaged. From the mass of correspondence in which this man Gray was absorbed, and the litter of papers about him, it was evident that he must have been in the house long before I made his acquaintance. Gray handed me a book, which I found to be a register of the names of the members of Brand's society, and pointed out the place for my signature. When I had written my name on the list, I said to Brand, Now that I have nominated myself, I suppose you'll second me? It is not necessary, he answered. You are already a member. Your remark to Miss Metford this morning made you one of us. You advised her, you recollect, to beware of us? That girl, I exclaimed, horrified. Then she is one of your spies. Is it possible? No, she is not one of our spies. We have none, and she knew nothing of the purpose for which she was used. Then I beg to say that you have made a shameful use of her. In the passion of the moment I forgot my manners to my host and formed the resolution to denounce the society to the police the moment I returned to London. Bran was not offended by my violence. There was not a trace of anger in his voice, as he said. Miss Metford's information was telepathically conveyed to my sister. Then it was your sister. My sister knows as little as the other. In turn, I received the information telepathically from her, without the knowledge of either. I was just telling Gray of it when you came into the room. And, said Gray, your intention to go straight from this house to Scotland Yard, there to denounce us to the police, has been telepathically received by myself. My God, I cried. Has a man no longer the right to his own thoughts? Gray went on without noticing my exclamation. Any overt or covert action on your part toward carrying out your intention will be telepathically conveyed to us and our executive. He shrugged his shoulders. I know, I said. Woking Cemetery, near St. Anne's Chapel. You have ground there. Yes, we have to dispense with... Say, murder? Dispense with, Gray repeated sharply. Any member whose loyalty is questionable. This is not our wish. It is our necessity. It is the only means by which we can secure the absolute immunity of the society pending the achievement of its object. To dispense with any living man we have only to will that he shall die. And now that I am a member, may I ask what is this object? the secret of which you guard with such fiendish zeal, I demanded angrily. The restoration of a local etheric tumor to its original formation. I am already weary of this jargon from Brand, I interrupted. What do you mean? We mean to attempt the reduction of the solar system to its elemental ether. And you will accomplish this trivality by means of Huxley's comet, I suppose? I could scarcely control my indignation. This fooling, as I thought it, struck me as insulting. Neither Bran nor Gray appeared to notice my keen resentment. Gray answered me in a quiet, serious tone. We shall attempt it by destroying the earth. We may fail in the complete achievement of our design, but in any case we shall at least be certain of reducing this planet to the ether of which it is composed. Of course, of course, I agreed derisively. You will at least make sure of that. You have found out how to do it, too, I have no doubt. Yes, said Gray, we have found out. End of chapter 5《The Crack of Doom》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To learn more, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tom Freya — The Crack of Doom by Thomas Cromey — A Telepathic Telegram I left the room and hurried outside without any positive plan for my movements. My brain was in such a whirl I could form no connected train of thought. These men, 
whose conversation was a jargon fitting only for lunatics, had proved that they could read my mind with the ease of a telegraph operator taking a message off a wire, that they further possessed marvelous, if not miraculous, powers over occult natural forces could hardly be doubted. The net in which I had voluntarily entangled myself was closing around me, an irresistible impulse to fly, to desert Natalie and save myself came over me. I put this aside presently. It was both unworthy and unwise. For whither should I fly? The ends of the earth would not be far enough to save me. The depths of the sea would not be deep enough to hide me from those who killed by willing that their victim should die. On the other hand, if my senses had only been hocused, and Messrs. Brandt and Gray were nothing better than clever tricksters, the park gate was far enough, and the nearest policeman force enough to save me from their vengeance. But the girl, Natalie, she was clairvoyant. They practiced upon her. My diagnosis of the strange seeing without sight expression of her eyes was then correct, and it was clear to me that whatsoever or whomsoever Brand and Gray believed or disbelieved in, they certainly believed in themselves. They might be relied on to spare nothing and no one in their project, however ridiculous or mad their purpose might be. What then availed my paltry protection when the girl herself was a willing victim, and the men omnipotent? Nevertheless, I failed eventually to serve her. I could at least do my best. It was clear that I must stand by Natalie Brand. While I was thus reflecting, the following conversation took place between Brand and Gray. I found a note of it in a diary, which Brand kept desultorily. He wrote this up so irregularly, no continuous information can be gleaned from it as to his life. How the diary came into my hands will be seen later. The memorandum is written thus. Gray, our new member, why did you introduce him? You say he cannot help with money. It is plain he cannot help with brains. Brand, he interests Natalie. He is what the uneducated call good-natured. He enjoys doing unselfish things, unaware that it is for the selfish sake of the agreeable sensation thereby secured. Besides, I like him myself. He amuses me. To make him a member was the only safe way of keeping him so much about us. But Natalie is the main reason. I am afraid of her wavering, in spite of my hypnotic influence. In a girl of her intensely emotional nature, the sentiment of hopeless love will create profound melancholy. Dominated by that, she is safe. It seems cruel at first sight. It is not really so. It is not cruel to reconcile her to a fate she cannot escape. It is merciful. For the rest, what does it matter? It will be all the same in... Gray. This day, six months. Brand. I believe I shivered. Heredity has much to answer for. That is the whole of the entry... I did not read the words until the hand that wrote them was dust. Natalie professed some disappointment when I announced my immediate return to town. I was obligated to manufacture an excuse for such a hasty departure, and so fell back on an old engagement which I had truly overlooked, and which really called me away. But it would have called long enough without an answer, if it had not been for Brand himself his friend Gray, and their insanities. My mind was fixed on one salient issue, how to get Natalie Brand out of her brother's evil influence. This would be better compassed when I myself was out of the scope of his extraordinary influence, and so I went without delay. For some time after my return to London, I went about visiting old haunts and friends. I soon tired of this. The haunts had lost their interest, the friends were changed, or I was changed. I could not resume the friendships which had been interrupted. The chain of connection had been broken, and the links would not weld easily. So, after some futile efforts to return to the circle I had long deserted, I desisted and accepted my exclusion with serenity. I am not sure that I desired the old relationships re-established, and as my long absence had prevented any fresh shoots of friendship being grafted, 
I found myself alone in London. I need say no more. One evening, I was walking through the streets in a despondent mood, as had become my habit. By chance, I read the name of a street into which I had turned to avoid a more crowded thoroughfare. It was that in which Miss Metford lived. I knew that she had returned to town, for she had briefly acquainted me with the fact on a postcard written some days previously. Here was a chance of distraction. This girl's spontaneous gaiety, which I found at first displeasing, was what I wanted to help me to shake off the gloomy incubus of thought oppressing me. It was hardly within the proprieties to call upon her at such an hour, but it could not matter very much when the girl's own ideas were so unconventional. She had independent means and lived apart from her family in order to be rid of domestic limitations. She had told me that she carried a latch-key. Indeed, she had shown it to me with a flourish of triumph, and that she delighted in free manners. Free manners, she was careful to add, did not mean bad manners. To my mind, the terms were synonymous. When opposite her number I decided to call, and having knocked at the door, was told that Miss Metford was at home. "'Hello, Marcel. Glad to see you,' she called out, somewhat stridently for my taste. Her dress was rather mannish, as usual. In lieu of her outdoor tunic, she wore a smoking jacket. When I entered, she was sitting in an armchair, with her feet on a music stool. She arose so hastily that the music stool was overturned and allowed to lie where it fell. "'What is the matter?' she asked, concerned. "'Have you seen a ghost?' "'I think I have seen many ghosts of late,' I said. "'And they have not been good company. I was passing your door, and I have come in for comfort.' She crossed the room and poured out some whiskey from a decanter which was standing on a sideboard. Then she opened the bottle of soda water with a facility which suggested practice. I was relieved to think that it was not Natalie who was my hostess. Handing me the glass, she said peremptorily, "'Drink that. That is right. Give me the glass. Now, smoke. Do I allow smoking here? Puh! I smoke here myself.' I lit a cigar and sat down beside her. The clouds began to lift from my brain and float off in the blue smoke wreaths. We talked of ordinary topics without once noticing how deftly they had been introduced by Miss Metford. I never thought of the flight of time until a chime from a tiny clock on the mantelpiece, an exquisite sample of the tasteful furniture of the whole room, warned me that my visit had lasted two hours. I arose reluctantly. She rallied me on my ingratitude. I had come in a sorry plight. I was now restored. She was no longer useful, therefore I left her, and so on, till I said with a solemnity no doubt lugubrious, I am most grateful, Miss Metford. I cannot tell you how grateful I am. You would not understand. Oh, please, leave my poor understanding alone, and tell me what has happened to you. I should like to hear it. And what's more, I like you. She said this so carelessly, I did not feel embarrassed. Now then, the whole story, please. Saying which, she sat down again. Do you really know nothing more of Brand's society than you admitted when I last spoke to you about it? I asked, without taking the chair she pushed over to me. This is all I know, she answered, in the rhyming voice of a young pupil, declaiming a piece of a little understood and less cared-for recitation. The society has very interesting evenings. Brand shows one beautiful experiments, which I dare say would be amazingly instructive if one were inclined that way, which I am not. The men are mostly long-haired creatures with spectacles. Some of them are rather good-looking. All are wholly mad, and my friend, I mean, the only girl I could ever stand as a friend, Natalie Bran, is crazy about them. Nothing more than that. Nothing more. The clock now struck the hour of nine, the warning chime for which had startled me. Is there anything else more than that? Miss Medford asked with some impatience. I thought for a moment. Unless my own senses had deceived me that evening in Bran's house, 
I ran a great risk of sharing George Delaney's fate if I remained where I was much longer. And suppose I told her all I knew. Would not that bring the same danger upon her, too? So I had to answer. I cannot tell you. I am a member now. Then you must know more than any mere outsider like myself. I suppose it would not be fair to ask you. Anyhow, you will come back and see me soon. By the way, what is your address? I gave her my address. She wrote it down on a silver case tablet and remarked, That will be all right. I'll look you up some evening. As I drove to my hotel, I felt that the mesmeric trick, or whatever artifice had been practiced upon me by Brand and Gray, had now assumed its true proportion. I laughed at my fears and was thankful that I had not described them to the strong-minded young woman, to whose kindly society I owed so much. What an idiot she would have thought me. A servant met me in the hall. Telegram, sir. Just arrived at this moment. I took the telegram and went upstairs with it unopened in my hand. A strange fear overcame me. I dared not open the envelope. I knew beforehand who the sender was, and, and what the drift of the message would be. I was right. It was from Brand. I beg you to be more cautious. Your discussion with Miss M. this evening might have been disastrous. I thought all was over at nine o'clock. Brand. I sat down, stupefied. When my senses returned, I looked at the table where I had thrown the telegram. It was not there, nor in the room. I rang for the man who had given it to me, and he came immediately. About that telegram you gave me just now, Phillips. I beg your pardon, sir, the man interrupted. I did not give you any telegram this evening. I mean, when you spoke to me in the hall. Yes, sir, I said good night, but you took no notice. Excuse me, sir, I thought you looked strange. Oh, I was thinking of something else, and I remember now it was Johnson who gave me the telegram. Johnson left yesterday, sir. Then it was yesterday I was thinking of. You may go, Phillips. So Brand's telepathic power was objective as well as subjective. My own brain unaccustomed to being impressed by another mind, otherwise than through the recognized channels of sense, had supplied the likeliest authority for its message. The message was duly delivered, but the telegram was a delusion. End of chapter 6section 7 of the crack of doom this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information please visit librivox.org read by tom freya the crack of doom by robert cromey chapter 7 guilty. As to protecting Natalie Brand from her brother and the fanatics with whom he associated, it was now plain that I was powerless. And what guarantee had I that she herself was unaware of his nefarious purpose, that she did not sympathize with it? This last thought flashed upon me one day, and the sting of pain that followed it was so intolerable. I determined instantly to prove its falsity or truth. I telegraphed to Brand that I was running down to spend a day or two with him, and followed my message without waiting for a reply. I have still a very distinct recollection of that journey, notwithstanding much that might well have blotted it from my memory. Every mile sped over seemed to mark one more barrier passed on my way to some strange fate. Every moment which brought me nearer this incomprehensible girl with her magical eyes was an epic of impossibility against my ever voluntarily turning back. And now that it was all over, I am glad that I went on steadfastly to the end." Brand received me with the easy affability of a man to whom good breeding had ceased to be a habit, and had become an instinct. 
Only once did anything pass between us, bearing on the extraordinary relationship which he had established with me. The relation of victor and victim, I considered it. We had been left together for a few moments, and I said as soon as the others were out of hearing distance, I got your message. I know you did, he replied. That was all. There was an awkward pause. It must be broken somehow. Any way out of the difficulty was better than to continue in it. Have you seen this? I asked, handing Bran a copy of a novel which I had picked up at a railway bookstall. When I say that it was new and popular, it will be understood that it was indecent. He looked at the title and said indifferently, Yes, I have seen it, and in order to appreciate this class of fiction fairly, I have even tried to read it. Why do you ask? Because I thought it would be in your line. It is very advanced, I said, to gain time. Advanced? Advanced? I am afraid I do not comprehend. What do you mean by advanced? And how could it be in my line? I presume you mean by that on my plane of thought. By advanced I mean up to date. What do you mean by it? If I use the word at all, I should mean educated, evolved. Is this evolved? Is it even educated? It is not always grammatical. It has no style. In motive it antedates Boccaccio. You disapprove of it. Certainly not. Then you approve it, notwithstanding your immediate condemnation? By no means. I neither approve nor disapprove. It only represents a phase of humanity, the deliberate purpose of securing money or notoriety to the individual, regardless of the welfare of the community. There is nothing to admire in that. It would be invidious to blame it when the whole social scheme is equally wrong and contemptible. By the way, what interest do you think the wares of any literary pander of either sex could possess for me, a student, even if a mistaken one, of science? I did not think the book would possess the slightest interest for you, and I suppose you are already aware of that. Ah, no, my telepathic power is reserved for more serious purposes. Its exercise costs me too much to expend it on trifles. In consequence, I do not know why you mention the book. To this I answered candidly. I mentioned it in order to get myself out of a conversational difficulty, without much success. Natalie was reserved with me at first, she devoted herself unnecessarily to a boy named Holly, who was staying with them. Gray had gone to London. His place was taken by Mr. Rockingham, whom I did not like. There was something sinister in his expression, and he rarely spoke save to say something cynical, and in consequence, disagreeable. He had seen life, that is, everything deleterious to and destructive of it. His connection with Brand was clearly a rebound, the rebound of disgust. There was nothing creditable to him in that. My first impression of him was thus unfavorable. My last recollection of him is a fitting item in the nightmare which contains it. The youth Holly would have interested me under ordinary circumstances, his face was as handsome and refined as that of a pretty girl. His figure, too, was slight and his voice effeminate. But there my own advantage, as I deemed it, over him, ceased. Intellectually he was a pupil of Brand's, who did his master credit. Having made this discovery, I did not pursue it. My mind was fixed too fast upon a definite issue, to be more than temporarily interested in the epigrams of a peachy-cheeked man of science. The afternoon was well advanced before I had an opportunity of speaking to Natalie. When it came, I did not stop to puzzle over a choice of phrases. I wish to speak to you alone on a subject of extreme importance to me, 
I said hurriedly. Will you come with me to the seashore? Your time, I know, is fully occupied. I would not ask this if my happiness did not depend upon it. The philosopher looked on me with grave, kind eyes, but the woman's heart within her sent the red blood flaming to her cheeks. It was then given to me to fathom the lowest depth of boorish stupidity I had ever sounded. I don't mean that, I cried. I would not dare. The blush on her cheek burnt deeper as she tossed her head proudly back and said straight out, without any show of fence or shadow of concealment. It was my mistake. I am glad to know that I did you an injustice. You are my friend, are you not? I believe I have the right to claim that title, I answered. Then what you ask is granted. Come. She put her hand boldly into mine. I grasped the slender fingers, saying, Yes, Natalie, some day I will prove to you that I am your friend. The proof is unnecessary, she replied in a low, sad voice. We started for the sea. Not a word was spoken on the way, nor did our eyes meet. We were in a strange position. It was this. The man who had vowed he was the woman's friend, who did not intend to shirk the proof of his promise, and never did gainsay it, meant to ask the woman before the day was over, to clear herself of knowingly associated with a gang of scientific murderers. The woman had vaguely divined his purpose and could not clear herself. When we arrived at the shore we occupied ourselves inconsequently. We hunted little fishes until Natalie's dainty boots were dripping. We examined quaint denizens of the shallow water until her gloves were spoilt. We sprang from rock to rock and evaded the onrush of the foaming waves. We made aqueducts for intercommunication between deep pools. We basked in the sunshine and listened to the deep moan of the sounding sea and the solemn murmur of the shells. We drank in the deep breath of the ocean, and for a brief space we were like happy children. The end came soon to this ephemeral happiness, it was only one of those bright coins snatched from the niggard hand of time, which must always be paid back with usurious charges. We paid with cruel interest. Standing on a flat rock side by side, I nerved myself to ask this girl the same question I had asked her friend, Edith Metford, how much she knew of the extraordinary and preposterous society, as I still tried to consider it which Herbert Brand had founded. She looked so frank, so refined, so kind, I hardly dared to put my brutal question to an innocent girl, whom I had seen wince at the suffering of a maimed bird, and pale to the lips at the death cry of a rabbit. This time there was no possibility of untoward consequence in the question, save to myself, for surely the girl was safe from her own brother and I myself preferred to risk the consequences rather than endure longer the thought that she belonged voluntarily to a vile murder club. Yet the question would not come. A simple thing brought it out. Natalie, after looking seaward silently for some minutes, said simply, How long are we to stand here, I wonder? Until you answer this question, how much do you know about your brother's society? which I have joined to my own intense regret. I am sorry you regret having joined, she replied gravely. You would not be sorry, said I, if you knew as much about it as I do. Forgetting that I had still no answer to my question, and that the extent of her knowledge was unknown to me. I believe I do know as much as you. There was a tremor in her voice and an anxious pleading look in her eyes. This look maddened me. Why should she plead to me unless she was guilty? I stamped my foot upon the rock without noticing that in so doing I kicked our whole collection of shells into the water. There was something more to ask, but I stood silent and sullen. The woods above the beach were choral with bird voices, 
they were hateful to me. The sea song of the tumbling waves was hideous. I cursed the yellow sunset light glaring on their snowy crests. A tiny hand was laid upon my arm. I writhed under its deadly, if delicious, touch. But I could not put it away, nor keep from turning to the sweet face beside me to mark once more its mute appeal, now more than mere appeal. It was supplication that was in her eyes. Her red lips were parted as though they voiced an unspoken prayer. At last a prayer did pass from them to me. Do not judge me until you know me better. Do not hate me without cause. I am not wicked, as you think. I, ah, uh, I am trying to do what I think is right. At least I am not selfish or cruel. Trust me yet a little while. I looked at her one moment, and then with a sob I clasped her in my arms and cried aloud. My God, to name murder and that angel face in one breath. Child, you have been befooled. You know nothing. For a second she lingered in my embrace. Then she gently put away my arms, and looking up at me said fearlessly but sorrowfully, I cannot lie, even for your love. I know all. End of section 7「The Crack of Doom」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by David Nyhoff. The Crack of Doom by Robert Cromie. Chapter 8 The Woking Mystery. She knew all. She was a murderess, or in sympathy with murderers. My arms fell from her. I drew back shuddering. I dare not look in her lying eyes, which cried pity when her base heart knew no mercy. Surely now I had solved the maddening puzzle which the character of this girl had so far presented to me. Yet the true solution was as far from me as ever. Indeed, I could not well have been further from it than at that moment. As we walked back, Natalie made two or three unsuccessful attempts to lure me out of the silence, which was certainly more eloquent on my part than any words I could have used. When she commenced, "'It's hard to explain,' I interrupted her harshly. "'No explanation is possible.' On that she put her handkerchief to her eyes, and a half-suppressed sob shook her slight figure. Her grief distracted me. But what could I say to assuage it? At the hall door I stopped and said, "'Good-bye. Are you not coming in?' There was a directness and emphasis in the question which did not escape me. I, the horror of my own voice surprised me, and assuredly did not pass without her notice. Very well, good-bye. We are not exactly slaves of convention here, but you are too far advanced in that direction even for me. This is your second startling departure from us. I trust you will spare me the humiliation entailed by the condescension of your further acquaintance. Give me an hour, I exclaimed aghast. You do not make allowances for the enigma in which everything is wrapped up. I said, I was your friend when I thought you of good report. Give me an hour, only an hour, to say whether I will stand by my promise, now that you yourself have claimed that your report is not good but evil, for that is really what you have protested. Do I ask too much? Or is your generosity more limited even than my own? Ah, no, I would not have you think that. Take an hour or a year, an hour only if you care for my happiness. Agreed, said I. I will take the hour. Discretion can have the year. So I left her. I could not go indoors. A roof would smother me. Give me the open lawns, the leafy woods, the breath of summer wind. Anyway, then, to the silence of the coming night, for an hour leave me to my thoughts. Her unworthiness was now more than suspect. 
it was admitted. My misery was complete. But I would not part with her. I could not. Innocent or guilty, she was mine. I must suffer with her or for her. The resolution by which I have abided was formed as I wandered lonely through the woods. When I reached my room that night, I found a note from Brand. To receive a letter from a man in whose house I was a guest did not surprise me. I was past that stage. There was nothing mysterious in the letter save its conclusion. It was simply an invitation to a public meeting of the Society, which was to be held on that day week in the hall in Hanover Square, and the special feature in the letter, seeing that it did not vanish like the telegram, but remained an ordinary sheet of paper, lay in its concluding sentence. This urged me to allow nothing to prevent my attendance. You will perhaps understand thereafter that we are neither political plotters nor lunatics as you have thought. Thought! The man's mysterious power was becoming wearisome. It was too much for me. I wished that I had never seen his face. As I lay sleepless in my bed, I recommenced the interminable introspection which, heretofore, had been so barren of result. It was easy to swear to myself that I would stand by Natalie Brand, that I would never desert her. But how should my action be directed in order that, by this conduct, I might prevail upon the girl herself to surrender her evil associates? I knew that she regarded me with affection, and I knew also that she would not leave her brother for my sake. Did she sympathize with his nefarious schemes, or was she decoyed into them like myself? Decoyed, that was it. I sprang from my bed beside myself with delight. Now I had not merely a loophole of escape from all these miseries. I had a royal highway. Fool, idiot, blind mole that I was, not to perceive sooner that easy solution to the problem. No wonder that she was wounded by my unworthy doubts. And she tried to explain, but I would not listen. I threw myself back and commenced to weave all manner of pleasant fancies around the salvation of this girl from her brother's baneful influence and the annihilation of his society, despite its occult powers, by my own valor. The reaction was too great. Instead of constructing marvelous counterplots, I fell sound asleep. Next day I found Natalie in a pleasant morning room to which I was directed. She wore her most extreme and in consequence most exasperating, rational costume. When I entered the room, she pushed a chair towards me in a way that suggested Miss Metaphor's worst manner, and lit a cigarette for the express purpose, I felt, of annoying me. She flung away her cigarette, her dark eyes opened wide in unassumed surprise, and that curious light of pity, which I had so often wondered at, came into them. I am very sorry if you have suffered— she said with convincing earnestness. How could I doubt you, senseless fool, that I was to suppose for one moment that you approved of what you could not choose but know? At this her face clouded. I'm afraid you are still in error. What opinion have you formed which alters your estimate of me? The only opinion possible, that you have unwillingly learned the secret of your brother's society, but like myself, you see no way to, to, to what purpose? To destroy it. I am not likely to attempt that. No, it would be impossible, and the effort would cost your life. That is not my reason. She arose and stood facing me. I do not like to lose your esteem. You already know that I will not lie to retain it. I approve of the society's purpose. And its actions? They're inevitable. Therefore, I approve also of its actions. I shall not ask you to remain now, for I see that you are again horrified, as it is natural, considering your knowledge, or, pardon me for saying so, your want of knowledge, I shall be glad to see you after the lecture to which you are invited. You will know a little more then, not all, perhaps, but enough to shake your time-dishonored theories of life and death. I bowed and left the room without a word. It was true, then, that she was mad like the others, or worse than mad, 
a thousand times worse. I said farewell to Brand as his guest for the last time. Thenceforward, I would meet him as his enemy, his secret enemy as far as I could preserve my secrecy with such a man, his open enemy when the proper time should come. In the railway carriage, I turned over some letters and papers which I found in my pockets. Not with deliberate intention, but to while away the time. One scrap startled me. It was a sheet on which Brand had written the Woking address, and on reading it over once more, a thought occurred to me to which I acted on as soon as possible. I could go to Woking and find out something about the man Delaney. So long as my inquiries were kept within the limits of strictest discretion, neither Brand nor any of his executives could blame me for seeking convincing evidence of this secret power they claimed. On my arrival in London, I drove immediately to the London Necropolis Company Station and caught the funeral train which runs to Brookwood Cemetery. With St. Anne's Chapel as my base, I made short excursions hither and thither and stood before a tombstone erected to the memory of George Delaney, late of the Criminal Investigation Department, Scotland Yard. This was a clue which I could follow, so I hurried back to town and called on the superintendent of the department. Yes, I was told, Delaney had belonged to the department. He had been a very successful officer in ferreting out foreign anarchists and evildoers. His last movement was to join a society of harmless cranks who met in Hanover Square. No importance was attached to this in the department. It could not have been done in a way of business, although Delaney pretended that it was. He dropped dead in the street as he was leaving his cab to enter the office with information which must have appeared to him important, to judge from the cabman's evidence as to his intense excitement and repeated directions for faster driving. There was an inquest and a post-mortem, but death from natural causes was the verdict. That was all. It was enough for me. I had now sufficient evidence and was finally convinced that the society was as dangerous as it was demented. End of Chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Crack of Doom This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Crack of Doom by Robert Cromie Qui bono? When I arrived at the Society's rooms on the evening for which I had an invitation, I found them pleasantly lighted. The various scientific diagrams and instruments had been removed, and comfortable armchairs were arranged, so that a free passage was available not merely to each row, but to each chair. The place was full when I entered, and soon afterwards the door was closed and locked. Natalie Brand and Edith Metford were seated beside each other. An empty chair was on Miss Metford's right. She saw me standing in the door, and nodded toward the empty seat which she had reserved for me. When I reached it, she made a movement as if to forestall me and leave me the middle chair. I deprecated this by a look which was intentionally so severe that she described it later as a malignant scowl. I could not at the moment seat myself voluntarily beside Natalie Brand with the exact and final knowledge which I had learned at Scotland Yard, only one week old. I could not do it just then, although I did not mean to draw back from what I had undertaken— to stand by her innocent or guilty, but I must have time to become accustomed to the sensation which followed this knowledge. Miss Metford's fugitive attempts at conversation pending the commencement of the lecture were disagreeable to me. There was a little stir on the platform. The chairman, in a few words, announced Herbert Brand. This is the first public lecture, he said, which has been given since the formation of the society, and in consequence of the fact that a number of people not scientifically educated are present, the lecturer will avoid the more esoteric phrases of his subject, which would otherwise present themselves in his treatment of it, and confine himself to the commonplaces of scientific insight. The title of the lecture is identical with that of our society. Qui bono? Brand came forward, unostentatiously, and placed a roll of paper on the reading desk. 
I have copied the extracts which follow from this manuscript. The whole essay indeed remains with me intact, but it is too long, and it would be immaterial to reproduce it all in this narrative. I cannot hope either to reproduce the weird impressiveness of a lecturer's personality, his hold over his audience, or my own emotions in listening to this man, whom I had proved not only from his own confession but by the strongest collateral evidence to be a callous and relentless murderer. To hear him glide with sonorous voice and graceful gesture from point to point in his logical and terrible indictment of suffering, the futility of it both in itself and that by which it was administered. No one could know Brand without finding interest if not pleasure in his many chance expressions, full of curious and mysterious thought. I had often listened to his extemporaneous brain pictures, as the reader knows, but I had never before heard him deliberately formulate a planned-out system of thought. In such a system, this is the gospel according to Brand. In the verbiage of primitive optimism, a misleading limitation is placed on the significance of the word nature in its inflections, and the misconception of the meaning of an important word is as certain to lead to an inaccurate concept as is the misstatement of a premise to precede a false conclusion. For instance, in the aphorism variously rendered, what is natural is right, there is an excellent illustration of the misapplication of the word natural. If the saying means that what is natural is just and wise, it might as well run what is natural is wrong, injustice and unwisdom being as natural, i.e. a part of nature as justice and wisdom. Morbidity and immorality are as natural as health and purity. Not more so, but not less so. That nature is made better by no mean, but nature makes that mean, is true enough. It is inevitably true. The question remains, in making that mean, has she really made anything that tends toward the final achievement of universal happiness? I say she has not. The misuse of a word, it may be argued, could not prove a serious obstacle to the growth of knowledge, and might be even interesting to the student of etymology. But behind the misuse of the word natural there is a serious confusion of thought, which must be clarified before the mass of human intelligence can arrive at a just appreciation of the verities which surround human existence and explain it. To this end, it is necessary to get rid of the archaic idea of nature as a paternal, providential and beneficent protector, a successor to the special providence, and to know the true nature, bond slave as she is, of her own eternal persistence of force, that sole primary principle of which all other principles are only correlatives, of which the existence of matter is but a cognizable evidence. The optimist's notion, therefore, that nature is an all-wise designer, in whose work order system, wisdom and beauty are prominent, does not fare well when placed under the microscope of scientific research. Order? There is no order in nature. Her armies are but seething mobs of rioters, destroying everything they can lay hands on. System? She has no system unless it be a reductio ad absurdum, which only blunders on the right way after fruitlessly trying every other conceivable path. She's not wise. She never fills a pail, but she spills a hogshead. All her works are not beautiful. She never makes a masterpiece, but she smashes a million wasters without a care. Theory of evolution, her gospel reeks with ruffianism, nature patented and promoted. The whole scheme of the universe, all material existence, as it is popularly known, is founded upon and begotten of a system of everlasting suffering as hideous, as the fantastic nightmares of religious maniacs. The Spanish inquisitors have been regarded as the most unnatural monsters who ever disgraced the history of mankind. Yet the atrocities of the inquisitors, like the battlefields of Napoleon and other heroes, were not only natural, but they have their prototypes in every cubic inch of stagnant water or ounce of diseased tissue. And stagnant water is as natural as sterilized water, and diseased tissue is as natural as healthy tissue. Wholesale murder is nature's first law. She creates only to kill and applies the rule as remorselessly to the units in a star drift as to the tadpoles in a horse pond. It seems a far cry from a star drift to a horse pond. It is so in distance and magnitude. 
it is not in the matter of constituents. In ultimate composition they are identical. The great nebula in Andromeda is an aggregation of atoms, and so is the river Thames. The only difference between them is the difference in the arrangement and incidence of these atoms, and in the molecular motion of which they are the first, but not the final, cause. In a pint of Thames water we know that there is bound up a latent force beside which steam and electricity are powerless in comparison. To release that force it is only necessary to apply the sympathetic key, just as the heated point of a needle will explode a mine of gunpowder and lay a city in ashes. That force is asleep. The atoms which could give it reality are at rest, or at least in a condition of quasi-rest. But in the stupendous mass of incandescent gas which constitutes the nebula of Andromeda, every atom is madly seeking rest and finding none, whirling in raging haste, battling with every other atom in its field of motion, impinging upon others and influencing them, being impinged upon and influenced by them. That awful cauldron exemplifies admirably the method of progress stimulated by suffering. It is the embryo of a new sun and his planets. After many million years of molecular agony, when his season of fission had come, he will rend huge fragments from his mass and hurl them helpless into space, there to grow into his satellites. In their turn they may reproduce themselves in like manner before their true planetary life begins, in which they shall revolve around their parent as solid spheres. Follow them further and learn how beneficent nature deals with them. After the lapse of time periods which man may calculate in figures but of which his finite mind cannot form even a true symbolic conception, the outer skin of the planet cools, rests. Internal troubles prevail for longer periods still, and these, in their unsupportable agony, bend and burst the solid strata overlying, vomit fire through their self-made blowholes, rear mountains from the depths of a sieve and dash them in pieces. Time strides on, steer. The globe still cools. Life appears upon it. Then begins anew the old strife, but under conditions far more dreadful, for though it be founded in atomic consciousness, the central consciousness of the heterogeneous aggregation of atoms becomes immeasurably more sentient and susceptible with every step it takes from homogenesis. This internecine war must continue while any creature, great or small, shall remain alive upon the world that bore it. By slow degrees the mighty milestones and the protoplasmic march are passed. Plants and animals are now busy murdering and devouring each other, the strong everywhere destroying the weak. New types appear, old types disappear. Types possessing the greatest capacity for murder progress most rapidly and those with the least recede and determine. The Neolithic man succeeds the Paleolithic man and sharpens the stone axe. Then to increase their power for destruction men find it better to hunt in packs. Communities appear. Soon each community discovers that its own advantage is fervored by confining its killing in the main to the members of neighboring communities. Nations early make the same discovery, and at last, as with ourselves, there is established a race with conscience enough to know that it is vile, and intelligence enough to know that it is insignificant. But what profits this? In the fullness of its time the race shall die. Man will go down into the pit, and all his thoughts will perish. The uneasy consciousness which in this obscure corner has for a brief space broken the silence of the universe will be at rest. Matter will know itself no longer. Life and death and love, stronger than death, will be as though they had never been. Nor will anything that is be better or be worse, for all that labour, genius, devotion and suffering of man have striven through countless generations to effect. The roaring loom of time weaves on, the globe cools out, life mercifully ceases from upon its surface, the atmosphere and water disappear. It rests. It is dead. But for its vicarious service in influencing more youthful planets within its reach, that dead world might as well be loosed at once from its gravitation cable and be turned adrift into space. Its time has not yet come. It will not come until the great central sun of the system to which it belongs has passed laboriously, 
through all his stages of stellar life and died out also then when that dead sun according to the impact theory blunders across the path of another sun dead and blind like himself its time will come the result of that impact will be a new star nebula with all its weary history before it a history of suffering in which a million years will not be long enough to write a single page here we have a scientific parallel to the hell of superstition which may account for the instinctive origin of the smoking flax and the fire which shall never be quenched we know that the atoms of which the human body is built up are atoms of matter it follows that every atom in every living body will be present in some form at that final impact in which the solar system will be ended in a blazing whirlwind which will melt the earth with its fervent heat there is not a molecule or cell in any creature alive this day which will not in its ultimate constituents endure the long agony lasting countless aeons of centuries wherein the solid mass of this great globe will be represented by a rush of incandescent gas stupendous in itself but trivial in comparison with the hurricane of flame in which it will be swallowed up and lost and when from that hell a new star emerges and new planets in their season are born of him and he and they repeat as they must repeat the ceaseless changeless remorseless story of the universe every atom in this earth will take its place and fill again functions identical with those which it or its fellow fills now life will reappear develop determined to be renewed again as before and so on for ever nature has known no rest from the beginning which never was she has been building up only to tear down again she has been fabricating pretty toys and trinkets that cost her many a thousand years to forge only to break them in pieces for her sport with infinite painstaking she has manufactured man only to torture him with mean miseries in the embryonic stages of his race and in his higher development to madden him with intellectual puzzles thus it will be unto the end which never shall be for there is neither beginning nor end to her unvarying cycles whether the secular optimist be successful or unsuccessful in realizing his paltry span of terrestrial paradise whether the pains he sings about it are prophetic dithrams or misleading myths no christian man need fear for his own immortality that is well assured in some form he will surely be raised from the dead in some shape he will live again but cui bono end of chapter nine Chapter 10 of The Crack of Doom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Yoganan. The Crack of Doom by Robert Cromey. Chapter 10 Force a Remedy. Get me out of this. I'm stifled. Ill. Miss Metford said in a low voice to me. As we were hurrying from the room, Brand and his sister, who had joined him, met us. The fire had died out of his eyes. His voice had written to its ordinary key. His demeanour was imperturbable, sphinx-like. I murmured some words about the eloquence of the lecture, but interrupted myself when I observed his complete indifference to my remarks, and said, Neither praise nor blame seems to affect you, Brand. Certainly not, he answered calmly. You forget that there is nothing deserving of either praise or blame? I knew I could not argue with him, so we passed on. Outside, I offered to find a cab for Miss Metford, and to my surprise, she allowed me to do so. Her self-assertive manner was visibly modified. She made no pretense of resenting the slight attention, as was usual with her in similar cases. Indeed, she asked me to accompany her as far as our ways lay together but I felt that my society at the time could hardly prove enlivening. I excused myself by saying candidly that I wished to be alone. My own company soon became unendurable. In despair, I turned to a music hall. The contrast between my mental excitement and the inanities of the stage was too acute, so this resource speedily failed me. Then I betook myself to the streets again. Here I remembered a letter Brand had put into my hand as I left the hall. It was short, and the tone was even more peremptory than his usual arrogance. It directed me to meet the members of the society at Charing Cross Station at two o'clock on the following day. 
No information was given, save that we were all going on a long journey, that I must set my affairs in such order that my absence would not cause any trouble, and the letter ended, Our experiments are now complete. Our plans are matured. Do not fail to attend. Fail to attend, I muttered. If I am not the most abject coward on the earth, I will attend, with every available placeman in London. The pent-up wrath and impotence of many days phoned voice at last. Yes, Brand, I shouted aloud. I will attend, and you shall be sorry for having invited me. But I will not be sorry, said Natalie Brand, touching my arm. You here, I exclaimed in great surprise, for it was fully an hour since I left the hall, and my movements had been at haphazard since then. Yes, I followed you for your own sake. Are you really going to draw back now? I must. Then I must go on alone. You will not go on alone. You will remain, and your friends shall go on without you. Go to prison without you, I mean. Poor boy, she said softly to herself. I wonder if I would have thought as I think now if I had known him sooner. I suppose I should have been as other women, and their fool's paradise would have been mine for a little while. The absolute hopelessness in her voice pierced my heart. I pleaded passionately with her to give up her brother and all the maniacs who followed him. For the time, I forgot utterly that the girl, by her own confession, was already with them in sympathy as well as in deed. She said to me, I cannot hold back now. And you? You know you are powerless to interfere. If you will not come with me, I must go alone. But you may remain. I have prevailed on Herbert and Gray to permit that. Never, I answered. Where you go, I go. It's not really necessary. In the end, it will make no difference. And remember, you will still think me guilty. Even so, I am going with you. Guilty. Now, this seemed to me a very ordinary speech, for who would have held back thinking her innocent? But Natalie stopped suddenly, and looking me in the face, said, almost with a sob, Arthur, I sometimes wish I had known you sooner. I might have been different. She was silent for a moment. Then... She said piteously to me, You will not fail me tomorrow? No, I will not fail you tomorrow, I answered. She pressed my hand gratefully and left me without any explanation as to her movements in the meantime. I hurried to my hotel to set my affairs in order before joining Brand's expedition. The time was short for this. Fortunately, there was not much to do. By midnight, I had my arrangements nearly complete. At the time, the greater part of my money was lying at call in a London bank. This I determined to draw on gold the next day. I also had at my banker some scrip, and I knew I could raise money on that. My personal effects and the mementos of my travels, which lay about my rooms in great confusion, must remain where they were. As to the few friends who still remained to me, I did not write to them. I could not well describe a project of which I knew nothing, save that it was being carried out by dangerous lunatics, or at least by men who were dangerous, whether their madness was real or assumed. Nor could I think of any reasonable excuse for leaving England after so long an absence without a personal visit to them. It was best then to disappear without a word. Having finished my dispositions, I changed my coat for a dressing gown and sat down by the window, which I threw open, for the summer night was warm. I sat long and did not leave my chair until the morning sun was shining on my face. When I got to Sharing Cross next day, a group of fifty or sixty people were standing apart from the general crowd and conversing with animation. Almost the whole strength of the society was assembled to see a few of us off, I thought. In fact, they were all going. About a dozen women were in the party, and they were dressed in the most extravagant rational costume. Edith Metford was amongst them. I drew her aside and apologized for not having called to wish her farewell, but she stopped me. Oh, it's all right. I'm going too. Don't look so frightened. This was more than I could tolerate. She was far too good a girl to be allowed to walk blindfold into the pit I had digged for myself with full knowledge. I said imperatively, Miss Metford, you shall not go. I warned you more than once, and warned you, I firmly believe, at the risk of my life against these people. You have disregarded the advice which it may yet cost me dear to have given you. To tell you the truth, she said candidly, I would not go an inch if it were not for yourself. I can't trust you with them. You would get into mischief. I don't mean with Natalie Brand, but the others. I don't like them. So I am coming to look after you. Then I shall speak to Brand. That would be useless. 
had joined the society this morning. This, she said seriously, and without anything of the spirit of bravado which was one of her faults. That ended our dispute. We exchanged a meaning look as a party took the seats. There was now, at any rate, one human being in the society to whom I could speak my mind. We travelled by special train. Our ultimate destination was a fishing village on the southern coast near Brand's residence. Here we found a steam yacht of about a thousand tons lying in the harbour with steam up. The vessel was a beautiful model. Her lines promised great speed, but the comfort of her passengers had been no less considered by a builder when he gave her so much beam and so high a freeboard. The ship's furniture was the finest I had ever seen and had crossed every great ocean in the world. The library especially was more suggestive of a room in the British Museum than the batch of books usually carried at sea. But I have no mind to enter on detailed description of a beautiful pleasure ship while my story waits. I only mention the general condition of the vessel in evidence of the fact which now struck me for the first time, Bran must have unlimited money. His mode of life in London and in the country, notwithstanding his pleasant house, was in the simplest style. From the moment we entered his special train at Charing Cross, he flung money about him with wanton recklessness. As we made our way through the crowd which was hanging about the quay, an unpleasant incident occurred. Miss Brand, with Haley and Walkingham, became separated from Miss Metford and myself and went on in front of us. We five had formed a subsection of the main body and were keeping to ourselves when the unavoidable separation took place. A slight scream in front caused Miss Metford and myself to hurry forward. We found the others surrounded by a gang of drunken sailors who had stopped them. A red-bearded giant, frenzied with drink, had seized Natalie in his arms. His abettor, a swarthy Italian, had drawn his knife and menaced Halley and Rockingham. The rest of the band looked on and cheered their chiefs. Halley was white to the lips. Rockingham was perfectly calm or perhaps indifferent. He called for a policeman. Neither interfered. I did not blame Rockingham. He was a man of the world, so nothing manly could be expected of him. But Halley's cowardice disgusted me. I rushed forward and caught the Italian from behind, for his knife was dangerous. Seizing him by the collar and waist, I swung him twice and then flung him from me with all my strength. He spun round two or three times and then collided with a stack of timber. His head struck a beam and he fell in his tracks without a word. The red-haired giant instantly released Natalie and put up his hands. The man's attitude showed that he knew nothing of defence. I swept his card aside and struck him violently on the neck close to the ear. I was a trained boxer, but I had never before struck a blow in earnest or in such earnest and I hardly knew my own strength. The man went down with a grunt like a poleaxed ox and lay where he fell. To a drunken sailor lad, who seemed anxious to be included in this matter, I dealt a stinging smack on the face with my open hand that satisfied him straight away. The others did not molest me. Turning from the crowd, I found Edith Metford looking at me with blazing eyes. Superb! Marcel, I am proud of you, she cried. Oh, Edith, how can you say that? Natalie Brand exclaimed, still trembling. Such dreadful violence. The poor man knew no better. Poor fiddlesticks. It's well for you that Marcel is a man of violence. He's worth a dozen sheep like... Like whom, Miss Metford? Rockingham asked, glaring at her so viciously that I interposed with a hasty entreaty that all should hurry to the ship. I did not trust the man. Miss Metford was not so easily suppressed. She said leisurely, I meant to say like you and this over-nervous but otherwise admirable boy. But if you think sheep derogatory, pray make it goats. I hurried them on board. Bran welcomed us to the gangway. The vessel was his own, so he was as much at home on the ship as in his country house. I had an important letter to write and very little time for the task. It was not finished a moment too soon, for the moment the last passenger and the last bale of luggage was on board, the captain's telegraph rang from the bridge and the Esmeralda steamed out to sea. My letter, however, was safe on shore. The land was low down upon the horizon before the long summer twilight deepened slowly into night. Then... One by one, the shadowy cliffs grew dim, dark, and disappeared. We saw no more of England until after many days of gradually culminating horror. The very night which was our first at sea did not pass without a strange adventure, which happened indeed by an innocent oversight. The End of Chapter 10 Chapter 11 of The Crack of Doom This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Yoganan. 
The Crack of Doom by Robert Cromie Chapter 11 Morituri T. Salutant We had been sitting on deck chairs smoking and talking for a couple of hours after the late dinner which was served as soon as the vessel was well out to sea when Bran came on deck he was hailed with enthusiasm this did not move him or even interest him i was careful not to join in the acclamations produced by his presence he noticed this and lightly called me recalcitrant i admitted the justice of the epithet and begged him to consider it one which would always supply to me with equal force he laughed at this and contrasted my gloomy fears with the excellent arrangements which he had made for my comfort i asked him what had become of gray i thought it strange that this man should be amongst the absentees oh gray he goes to labrador to labrador what takes him to labrador the same purpose which takes us to the arafura sea brand answered and passed on presently there was a slight stir among the people and the word was passed round that bran was about to undertake some interesting experiment for the amusement of his guests i hurried aft along with some other men with whom i had been talking and found miss bran and miss metford standing hand in hand natalie's face was very white and the only time i ever saw real fear upon it was at that moment i thought the incident on the quay had unnerved her more than was apparent at the time and that she was still upset by it she beckoned to me and when i came to her she seized my hand she was trembling so much her words were hardly articulate miss metford was concerned for her companion's nervousness but otherwise indifferent while natalie stood holding her hands in hers like a frightened child awaiting the firing of a cannon he's going to let off something a rocket i suppose miss metford said to me natalie seems to think he means to sink the ship he does not mean to do so he might if an accident occurred is he going to fire a mine i asked no he's going to etherize a drop of water natalie said this so seriously we had no thought of laughter incongruous as a cause of our fears might seem at that moment bran addressed us from the top of the deck house and explained that in order to illustrate on a large scale the most recent discovery in natural science he was about to disintegrate a drop of water at present encased in a hollow glass bowl about the size of a pea which he held between his thumb and forefinger an electric light was turned upon him so that we could all see the thing quite plainly he explained that there was a division in the bowl one portion of it containing the drop of water and the other the agent by which when the dividing bowl was eaten through by its action the atoms of water would be resolved into the ultimate ether of which they were composed as the disintegrating agent was powerless in salt water we might all feel assured that no great catastrophe would ensue before throwing the glass bowl overboard a careful search for the lights of ships was made from east to west and north to south there was not a light to be seen anywhere bran threw the bowl over the side we were going under easy steam at the time but the moment he left the deck house full speed ahead was rung from the bridge and the esmeralda showed us a pace she literally tore through the water when the engines were got full on before we had gone a hundred yards a great cry arose a little fleet of french fishing boats with no lights up had been lying very close to us on the starboard bow there they were boatfuls of men who waved careless adieus to us as we dashed past bran was moved for a moment then he shrugged his shoulders and muttered it can't be helped now we all felt that these simple words might mean much to test their full portent i went over to him natalie still holding my hand with trembling fingers can't you do anything for them i asked you mean go back and sink the ship to keep them company no but warn them to fly it would be useless in this breeze they could not sail a hundred yards in the time allowed and three miles is the nearest point of safety i could not say definitely as this is the first time i've ever tried an experiment so tremendous but i believe that if he even slowed to half speed it would be dangerous and if he stopped the esmeralda would go to the bottom tonight as certainly as the sun will rise tomorrow natalie moaned in anguish on hearing this i said to her sternly i thought you approved of all these actions this serves no purpose these men may not even have a painless death and the reality is more awful than i thought every face was turned to that point in the darkness toward which the foaming wake of esmeralda stretched back not a word more was spoken until brand was standing watch in hand beside the light from the deck house came aft and said you will see the explosion in 10 seconds he could not have spoken more indifferently of the catastrophe at plan was only the firing of a penny squib then the sea behind us burst into a flame followed by the sound of an explosion so frightful that we were almost stunned by it 
a huge mass of water torn up in a solid block was hurled into the air and there it broke into a hundred roaring cataracts these in the brilliant searchlight from the ship which was now turned upon them full fell like cataracts of liquid silver into the seething cauldron of water that raged below the instant the explosion was over our engines were reversed and the esmeralda went full speed astern the waves were still rolling in tumultuous breakers when we got back we might as well have gone on the french fishing fleet had disappeared i could not help saying to bran before he turned in you expect us i suppose to believe that the explosion was really caused by a drop of water etherized he interrupted certainly i do you don't believe it on what grounds that it is unbelievable sha you deny a fact because you do not understand it ignorance is not evidence i say it is impossible you do not wish to believe it possible wishes are not proofs without pursuing the argument i said to him it is fortunate that the accident took place at sea there will be no inquest oh i'm sorry for the accident as for the men they might have had a worse fate it is better than living in a lifelong misery as they do besides both they and the fishes that will eat them will soon be numbered amongst the things that have been the end of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of The Crack of Doom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit librivox.org. The Crack of Doom by Robert Cromey. No death save in life. For some days afterwards our voyage was uneventful but the usual shipboard amusements were requisitioned to while away the tedious hours the french fishing fleet was never mentioned we got through the bay with very little knocking about and passed the rock without calling i was not disappointed for there was slight inducement for going ashore oppressed as i was with the ever-present incubus of dread at intervals this feeling became less acute but only to return strengthened by its short absences after a time my danger sense became blunted the nervous system became torpid under continuous stress and refused to pass on the sensations of sufficient intensity to the brain all the weary brain was asleep at its post and did not heed the warnings i could think no more and this reminds me of something which i must tell you about young holly for several days after the voyage began the boy avoided me i knew his reason for doing this i myself did not blame him for his want of physical courage but i was glad that he himself was ashamed of it holly came to me one morning and said i wish to speak to you marcel i must speak to you it is about that miserable episode on the evening we left england i acted like a cad therefore i must be a cad i only want to tell you that i despise myself as much as you can and that i envy you i never thought that i should envy a man simply because he had no nervous system who is this man without a nervous system of whom you speak i asked coldly i was not sorry that i had an opportunity of reading him a lesson which might be placed opposite the many indignities which had been put upon me in the form mainly of shoulder shrugs brow elevations and the like you of course i mean no offence you are magnificent i am honest in saying that i admire you i wish i was like you in height weight muscle and absence of nervous system you would keep your own brain i suppose i asked yes i would keep that and i will keep my own nervous system i replied and the difference between mine and yours is this that whereas my own danger sense is or was as keen as your own i have my reserve of nerve force or had it which might be relied on to tide me over a sudden emergency this reserve you have expended on your brain there are two kinds of cowards the selfish coward who cares for no interest save his own the unselfish coward who cares nothing for himself but who cannot face a danger because he dare not and there are two kinds of brave men the nerveless man you spoke of who simply faces danger because he does not appreciate it and the man who faces danger because although he fears it he dares it i have no difficulty in placing you in this list you place me a coward because you cannot help it you are merely out of harmony with your environment 
You ought to bring a supply of environment about with you, seeing that you cannot manufacture it off-hand like myself. I wish to be alone. Good day. Before I go, Marcel, I will say this. There were tears in his eyes. These people do not really know you with all their telepathic power. You are not... not... not as great a fool as they think. Thank you. I mean to prove that to them some day. With that, I turned away from him, although I felt that he would have gladly stayed longer with me. While the Esmeralda was sweeping over the long swells of the Mediterranean, I heard Brand lecture for the second time. It was a fitting interlude between his first and third addresses. I might classify them thus, the first critical, the second constructive, the third executive. His third speech was the last he made in the world. We were assembled in the saloon. It would have been pleasanter on the upper deck, owing to the heat, but the speaker could not then have been easily heard in the noise of the wind and waves. I could scarcely believe that it was Brand who rose to speak, so changed was his expression. The frank scepticism, which had only recently degenerated into a cynicism, still tempered with a half-kindly air of easy superiority, was gone. In its place there was a look of concentrated and relentless purpose which dominated the man himself and all who saw him. He began in forcible and direct sentences with only a faintly reminiscent eloquence, which was part of himself, and from which he could not without a conscious effort have freed his style. But the whole bearing of the man had little trace in it of the dilettant academician whom we all remembered. When I last addressed the society, he began, I laboured under a difficulty in arriving at ultimate truth, which was of my own manufacture. I presupposed, as you will remember, the indestructibility of the atom, and in logical consequence, I was bound to admit the conservation of suffering, the eternity of misery. But on that evening many of my audience were untaught in the rudiments of ultimate thought, and some were still sceptical of the bona fides of our purpose and our power to achieve its object. To them, in their then ineptitude, what I shall say now would have been unintelligible. For in the same way that the waves of light or sound exceeding a certain maximum cannot be transferred to the brain by dull eyes and ears, my thought pulsations would have escaped those auditors by virtue of their own irresponsiveness. Tonight I am free from the limitation which I then suffered because there are none around me now who have not sufficient knowledge to grasp what I shall present. You remember that I traced for you the story of evolution in its journey from the atom to the star, and I showed you that the hypothesis of the indestructibility of the atom was simply a creed of cruelty writ large. I now proceed on the lines of true science to show you how that hypothesis is false, but as the atom is destructible, as you have seen by our experiments, the last of which resulted in a climax not intended by me, the whole scheme of what is called creation falls to pieces. As the atom was the first etheric blunder, so the material universe is the grand etheric mistake. In considering the marvellous and miserable succession of errors resulting from the meretricious atomic remedy adopted by the ether to cure its local source, it must first be said of the ether itself that there is too much of it. Space is not sufficient for it. Thus, the particles of ether, those imponderable entities which vibrate through a block of marble or a disc of hammered steel, with only a dulled, not an annihilated motion, are by their own tumultuous plenty packed closer together than they wish. I say wish, for if all material consciousness and sentiency be founded in atomic consciousness, then in its turn atomic consciousness is founded upon and dependent on etheric consciousness. These particles of ether, therefore, when too closely impinged upon by their neighbours, resent the impact, and in doing so initiate etheric whirlwinds, from whose vast perturbances stupendous drifts set out. In their gigantic power these avalanches crash the particles which impede them, force the resisting medium out of its normal stage, destroy the homogeneity of its constituents, and mass them into individualistic communities whose vibrations play with greater freedom when they synchronize. The homogeneous etheric tendencies recede and finally determine. Behold a miracle! An atom is born! 
by a similar process which i may liken to that of putting off an evil day which some time must be endured the atoms group themselves into molecules in their turn the molecules go forth to war capturing or being captured the vibrations of the slaves always being forced to synchronize with those of their conquerors the nucleus of the gas of a primal metal is now complete and the foundation of a solar system paltry molecule of the universe as it is is led thereafter the rest is easily followed it is described in your school books and must not occupy me now but one word i will interpolate which may serve to explain a curious and interesting human belief you are aware of how in times past men of absolutely no scientific insight held firmly to the idea that an elixir of life and a philosopher's stone might be discovered and that these two objects were nearly always pursued contemporaneously that is to my mind an extraordinary example of the force of atomic consciousness the idea itself was absolutely correct but the men who followed it had slight knowledge of its unity and none whatever of its proper pursuit they would have worked on their special lines to eternity before advancing a single step toward their object and this because they did not know what life was and death was and what the metals ultimately signified which they blind fools so unsuccessfully tried to transmute but we know more than they we have climbed no doubt in the footholds they have carved and we have gained the summit they only saw in the marriage of hope for we know that there is no life no death no metals no matter no emotions no thoughts but that all we call by these names is only the ether in various conditions life i could live as long as this earth will submit to human existence if i had studied that paltry problem metals the ship in which you sail was bought with gold manufactured in my crucibles the unintelligent or i should say the grossly ignorant have long held over the heads of the pioneers of science these two great charges no man has ever yet transmuted a metal no man has ever yet proved the connecting link between organic and inorganic life i say life for i take it that this company admits that a slab of granite is as much alive as any man or woman i see before me but i have manufactured gold and i could have manufactured protoplasm if i had devoted my life to that object my studies have been almost wholly on the inorganic plane hence the philosopher's stone came in my way but not the elixir of life the molecules of protoplasm are only a little more complex than the molecules of hydrogen or nitrogen or iron or coal you may fuse iron vaporize water intermix the cases but the molecules of all change little in such metamorphoses and you may slay twenty thousand men at waterloo or seddon or ten thousand generations may be numbered with the dust and not an ounce of protoplasm lies dead all molecules are merely arrangements of atoms made under different degrees of pressure and of different ages and all atoms are constructed of identical constituents the ether as i have said therefore the ether which was from the beginning is now and ever shall be which is the same yesterday to-day and for ever is the origin of force of matter of life it is alive its starry children are so many that the sands of the seashore may not be used as a similitude for their multitude and they extend so far that distance may not be named in relation to them they are so high above us and so deep below us that there is neither height nor depth in them there is neither east nor west in them nor north and south in them nor is there a beginning or end to them time drops his scythe and stands appalled before that dreadful host number applies not to its eternal multitudes distance is lost in boundless space and from all the stars that stud the caverns of the universe there swells this awful chorus failure failure and futility and the ether is to blame heterogeneous suffering is more acute than homogeneous because the agony is intensified by being localized because the comfort of the comfortable is purchasable only by the multiplied misery of the miserable because aristocratic leisure requires that the poor should be always with it 
there is therefore no gladness without its overbalancing sorrow there is no good without intenser evil there is no death save in life back then from this ill-balanced and unfair long-suffering this unsufficient existence back to nirvana the ether and i will lead the way the agent i will employ has cost me all life to discover it will release the vast stores of the ferric energy locked up in the huge atomic warehouse of this planet i shall remedy the grand mistake only to a degree which it would be preposterous to call even microscopic but when i have done what i can i am blameless for the rest in due season the whole blunder will be cured by the same means that i shall use and all the hideous experiment will be over and everlasting rest or quasi-rest will supersede the magnificent failure of material existence this earth at least and i am encouraged to hope the whole solar system will by my instrumentality be restored to the ether form which it never should have emerged once before in the history of our system an effort similar to mine was made unhappily without success this time we shall not fail a low murmur rose from the audience as the lecturer concluded and a hushed whisper asked where was that other effort made brand faced round momentarily and said quietly but distinctly on the planet which was where the asteroids are now end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the crack of doom this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rutger. The Crack of Doom by Robert Cromie. Miss Metford's Plan. We coaled at Port Said like any ordinary steamer. Although I had more than once made the Red Sea voyage, I had never before taken the slightest interest in the coaling of the vessel on which I was a passenger. This time everything was different. That which interested me before seemed trivial now, and that which had before seemed trivial was now absorbing. I watched the coaling, commonplace as the spectacle was, with vivid curiosity. The red lights, the sooty demons at work, every bag of coals that they carried, and all the cold dust clouds they created, were fitting episodes on a voyage such as ours. We took an enormous quantity of coal on board. I remained up most of the night in a frame of mind which I thought none might envy. I myself would have made light of it had I known what was still in store for the Esmeralda and her company. It was nearly morning when I turned in. When I awoke, we were nearing the Red Sea. On deck, the conversation of our party was always eccentric. But this must be said for it. There was sometimes a scintillating brilliance in it that almost blinded one to its extreme absurdity. The show of high spirits, which was very general, was, in the main, unaffected. For the rest, it was plainly assumed. But those who assumed their parts did so with a histrionic power, which was all the more surprising when it is remembered that the origin of their excellent playing was centered in their own fears. I preserved a neutral attitude. I did not venture on any overt act of insubordination. That would only have meant my destruction without any counterbalancing advantage in the way of balking an enterprise in which I was a most unwilling participator. And to pretend what I did not feel was a task which I had neither stomach to undertake nor ability to carry out successfully. In consequence, I kept my own counsel, and that of Edith Metford. Brand was the most easily approached maniac I had ever met. His affability continued absolutely consistent. I took advantage of this to say to him on a convenient opportunity, Why did you bring these people with you? They must all be useless, and many of them little better than a nuisance. Marcel, you are improving. Have you attained the telepathic power? You have read my mind. This was said with a pleasant smile. I cannot read your mind, I answered. I only diagnose. Your diagnosis is correct. I answer you in a sentence. 
They are all sympathetic and human sympathy is necessary to me until my purpose is fulfilled. You do not look to me for any measure of sympathy, I trust. I do not. You are antipathetic. I am, but necessary all the same. So be it until the proper time shall come. It will never come, Brand said firmly. We shall see, I replied as firmly as himself. Next evening, as we were steaming down the blue waters, deep blue they always seemed to me, of the Red Sea, I was sitting on the foredeck smoking and trying to think. I did not notice how the time passed. What seemed to me an hour at most must have been three or four. With the exception of the men of the crew who were on duty, I was alone. For the heat was intense, and most of our people were lying in their cabins, prostrated in spite of the wind sails, which were spread from every port to catch the breeze. My meditations were, as usual, gloomy and despondent. They were interrupted by Miss Metford. She joined me so noiselessly that I was not aware of her presence until she laid her hand on my arm. I started at her touch, but she whispered a sharp warning, so full of suppressed emotion that I instantly recovered a semblance of unconcern. The girl was very white and nervous. This contrast from her usual equanimity was disquieting. She clung to me hysterically as she gasped, Marcel, it is a mercy I have found you alone, that there is one sane man in this ship full of lunatics. I am afraid you are not altogether right, I said as I placed a seat for her close to mine. I can hardly be sane when I am a voluntary passenger on board this vessel. Do you really think they mean what they say? She asked hurriedly without noticing my remark. I really think they have discovered the secret of extraordinary natural forces so powerful and so terrible that no one can say what they may or may not accomplish. And that is the reason I begged you not to come on this voyage. What was the good of asking me not to come without giving me some reason? Had I done so, they might have killed you as they have done others before. You might have chanced that, seeing that it probably will end that way. And they would certainly have killed me. Ah! I wondered at the intensity of the girl's sharp gasp when I said this, and marveled too how she, who had always been so mannish, nestled close to me and allowed her head to sink down on my shoulder. I pitied the strong-willed, self-reliant nature, which had given way under some strain of which I had yet to be told. So I stooped and touched her cheek with my lips in a friendly way, at which she looked up to me with half-closed eyes and whispered in a voice strangely soft and womanish for her, If they must kill us, I wish they would kill us now. I stroked her soft cheek gently, and urged a less hopeless view. Even if the worst come, we may as well live as long as we can. Whereupon, to my surprise, she, having shot one quick glance into my eyes, put my arm away and drew her chair apart from mine. Her head was turned away from me, but I could not but notice that her bosom rose and fell swiftly. Presently she faced round again, lit a cigarette, put her hands in the pocket of her jacket and her feet on another chair and said indifferently, You are right. Even if the worst must come, we may as well live as long as we can. This sudden change in her manner surprised me. I knew I had no art in dealing with women, so I let it pass without comment and looked out at the glassy sea. After some minutes of silence, the girl spoke to me again. Do you know anything of the actual plans of these maniacs? No, I only know their preposterous purpose. Well, I know how it is to be done. Natalie was restless last night. You know that we share the same cabin, and she raved a bit. I kept her in her berth by sheer force, but I allowed her to talk. This was serious. I drew my chair close to Miss Metford's and whispered, for heaven's sake, speak low. 
Then I remembered Bran's power and wrung my hands in helpless impotence. You forget Bran. At this moment, he is taking down every word we say. He's doing nothing of the sort. But you forget. I don't forget. By accident, I put morphia in the tonic he takes, and he is now past telepathy for some hours at least. He's sound asleep. I suppose if I had not done it by accident, he would have known what I was doing, and so have refused the medicine. Anyhow, accident or no accident, I have done it. Thank God, I cried. And this precious disintegrating agent, they haven't it with them, it seems. To manufacture it in sufficient quantity would be impossible in any civilized country without fear of detection or interruption. Brand has the prescription, formula, what do you call it? And if you could get the paper and throw it overboard, rubbish, they would work it all out again. What then, I whispered, steal the paper and wouldn't it do to put an extra X or Y or stick a couple of additional figures into any suitable vacancy? Don't you think they'd go on with the scheme and... And, and make a mess of it. Miss Metford, I said, rising from my chair. I mean, Metford. I know you like to be addressed as a man, or used to like it. Yes, I used to, she assented coolly. I am going to take you in my arms and kiss you. I'm hanged if you are, she exclaimed so sharply that I was suddenly abashed. My intended familiarity and its expression appeared grotesque, although a few minutes before she was so friendly. But I could not waste precious time in studying the girl's caprices, so I asked at once, How can I get this paper? I said, Steal it, if you recollect. Her voice was now hard, almost harsh. You can get it in Bran's cabin, if you are neither afraid nor jealous. I am not much afraid, and I will try it. What do you mean by jealous? I mean, would you to save Natalie Brand, for they will certainly succeed in blowing themselves up, if nobody else, consent to her marrying another man. Say that young lunatic Hallie, who is always dangling after her when you are not. Yes, I answered after some thought, for Hallie's attentions to Natalie had been so marked the plainly inconsequent mention of him in this matter did not strike me. If that is necessary to save her, of course I would consent to it. Why do you ask? In my place, you would do the same. No, I'd see the ship and all its precious passengers at the bottom of the sea first. Ah, but you are not a man. Right, and what's more, I'm glad of it. Then looking down at the rational part of her costume, she added sharply, I shan't wear these things again. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of The Crack of Doom This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rucker. The Crack of Doom by Robert Cromie. Rockingham to the Sharks. At one in the morning I arose, dressed hurriedly, drew on a pair of felt slippers, and put a revolver in my pocket. It was then time to put Edith Metford's proposal to the proof, and she would be waiting for me on deck to hear whether I had succeeded in it. We had parted a couple hours before on somewhat chilling terms. I had agreed to follow her suggestion, but I could not trouble my tired brain by guesses at the cause of her moods. It was very dark. There was only enough light to enable me to find my way along the corridor, off which the staterooms occupied by Brand and his immediate lieutenants opened. All the sleepers were restless from the terrible heat. As I stole along, a muffled word, a sigh, or a movement in the berths made me pause at every step with a beating heart. Having listened till all was quiet, 
I moved on again noiselessly. I was almost at the end of the corridor. So intent had I been on preserving perfect silence. It did not sooner occur to me that I was searching for any special door. I had forgotten Brand's number. I could no more think of it than one can recall the name of a half-forgotten acquaintance suddenly encountered in the street. It might have been 14, or 41, or 150. Every number was as likely as it was unlikely. I tried vainly to concentrate my mind. The result was nothing. The missing number gave no clue. To enter the wrong room in that ship at that hour meant death for me. Of that I was certain. To leave the right room unentered gave away my first chance in the unequaled battle with Brand. Then, as I knew that my first chance would probably be my last, if not availed of, I turned to the nearest door and quietly tried the handle. The door was not locked. I entered the stateroom. What do you want? It was Hallie's voice that came from the berth. Pardon me, I whispered. A mistake. The heat, you know, went on deck and have blundered into your room. All right. Who are you? Brand. Good night. You did not blunder far. This sleepily. I went out and closed the door quietly. I had gained something. I was within one door of my destination, for I knew that Halley was berthed between Rockingham and Brand. But I did not know on which side Brand's room was, and I dared not ask. I tried the next door going forward. It opened like the other. I went in. Hello there. This time no sleepy or careless man challenged me. It was Rockingham's voice. May I not enter my own room? I whispered. This is not your room. You are. Rockingham sprang up in his berth, but before he could leave it, I was upon him. I am Arthur Marcel, and this iron ring which I pressed against your left ear is the muzzle of my revolver. Speak, move, breathe above your natural breath, and your brains go through that porthole. Now loose hold of my arm and come with me. You fool, hissed Rockingham. You dare not fire. You know you dare not. He was about to call out, but my left hand closed on his throat, and a gurgling gasp was all that issued from him. I laid down the revolver and turned the ear of the strangling man close to my mouth. I had little time to think, but thought flies fast when such deadly peril menaces the thinker as that which I must face if I failed to make terms with the man who was in my power. I knew that notwithstanding his intensely disagreeable nature, if he gave his promise either by spoken word or equivalent sign, I could depend upon him. There were no liars in Brand's society, but the word I could not trust him to say... I must have his sign, I whispered. You know I do not wish to kill you. I shall never have another happy day if you force me to it. I have no choice. You must yield or die. If you will yield and stand by me rather than against me in what shall follow, choose life by taking your right hand from my wrist and touching my left shoulder. I will not hurt you meanwhile. If you choose death, Touch me with your left. The sweat stood on my forehead in big beads as I waited for his choice. It was soon made. He unlocked his left hand and placed it firmly on my right shoulder. He had chosen death. So the man was only a physical coward, or perhaps he had only made a choice of alternatives. I said slowly and in great agony, May God have mercy on your soul and mine, on which the muscles in my left arm stiffened, the big biceps and heirloom of my athletic days thickened up, and I turned my eyes away from the dying face, half hidden by the darkness. His struggles were very terrible, but with my weight upon his lower limbs and my grasp upon his windpipe, that death row was as silent as it was horrible. The end came slowly. I could not bear the horror of it longer. I must finish it and be done with it. 
I put my right arm under the man's shoulder and raised the upper part of his body from the berth. Then a desperate wrench with my left arm, and there was a dull crack like the snapping of a dry stick. It was over. Rockingham's neck was broken. I wiped away the bloody froth that oozed from the gaping mouth and tried to compose decently the contorted figure. I covered the face, then I started on my last mission, for now I knew the door. I had bought the knowledge dearly, and I meant to use it for my own purpose, careless of what violence might be necessary to accomplish my end. When I entered Brand's stateroom, I found the electric light full on. He was seated at a writing table with his head resting on his arms, which hung crossways over the desk. The sleeper breathed so deeply that it was evident that the effect of the morphia was still strong upon him. One hand clutched a folded parchment. His fingers clasped it nervelessly, and I had only to force them open one by one in order to withdraw the manuscript. As I did this, he moaned and moved in his chair. I had no fear of his awakening. My hand shook as I unfolded the parchment, which I had unconsciously handled as carefully as though the thing itself were as deadly as the destruction which might be wrought by its direction. To me, the whole document was a mass of unintelligible formulae. My rusty university education could make nothing of it, but I could not waste time in trying to solve the puzzle for I did not know what moment some other visitor might arrive to see how Brand fared. I first examined with a pocket microscope the ink of the manuscript, and then, making the scratch with Brand's pen on a page of my notebook, compared the two. The colors were identical. It was the same ink. In several places where a narrow space had been left vacant, I put one in front of the figures, which followed. I had no reason for making this particular alteration, save that the figure one is more easily forged than any other, and the forgery is consequently more difficult to detect. My additions, when the ink was dry, could only have been discovered by one who was informed that the document had been tampered with. It was probable that a drawer which stood open with the keys in the lock was the place where Brand kept this paper where he would look for it on awaking. I locked it in the drawer and put the keys into his pocket. There was something still to do with the sleeping man, whose brain compassed such marvelous powers. His telepathic faculty must be destroyed. I must keep him seriously ill without killing him. As long as he remained alive, his friends would never question his calculations, and the fiasco which was possible under any circumstances would then be assured. I had with me an eastern drug, which I had bought from an Indian fakir once in Mirzapur. The man was an impostor whose tricks did not impose on me, but the drug, however he came by it, was reliable. It was a poison which produced a mild form of cerebritis, that dulled but did not deaden the mental powers. It acted almost identically whether administered subcutaneously or, of course in a larger dose, internally. I brought it home with the intention of giving it to a friend who was interested in vivisection. I did not think that I myself should be the first and last to experiment with it. It served my purpose well. The moment I pricked his skin... Brand moved in his seat. My hand was on his throat. He nestled his head down again upon his arms and drew a deep breath. Had he moved again, that breath would have been his last. I had been so wrought upon by what I had already done that night, I would have taken his life without the slightest hesitation if the sacrifice seemed necessary." When my operation was over, I left the room and moved silently along the corridor till I came to the ladder leading to the deck. Edith Metford was waiting for me as we had arranged. She was shivering in spite of the awful heat. Have you done it? she whispered. I have, I answered without saying how much I had done. Now you must retire and rest easy. 
the formula won't work. I put both it and Brand himself out of gear. Thank God, she gasped, and then a sudden faintness came over her. It passed quickly, and as soon as she was sufficiently restored, I begged her to go below. She pleaded that she could not sleep and asked me to remain with her upon the deck. It would be absurd to suppose that either of us could sleep this night, she very truly said, on which I was obliged to tell her plainly that she must go below. I had more to do. Can I help? she asked anxiously. No, if you could, I would ask you, for you are a brave girl. I have something now to get through which is not woman's work. Your work is my work, she answered. What is it? I have to lower a body overboard without anyone observing me. There was no time for discussion, so I told her at once, knowing that she would not give way otherwise. She started at my words, but said firmly, How will you do that unobserved by the watch? Go down and bring up your... bring it up. I will keep the men employed. She went forward, and I turned again to the companion. When I got back to Rockingham's cabin, I took a sheet of paper and wrote, Heat! Mad! Making no attempt to imitate his writing, I simply scrawled the words with a rough pen in the hope that they would pass as a message from a man who was hysterical when he wrote them. Then I turned to the berth and took up the body. It was not a pleasant thing to do, but it must be done. I was a long time reaching the deck, for the arms and legs swung to and fro, and I had to move cautiously, lest they should knock against the woodwork I had to pass. I got it safely up and hurried aft with it. Edith, I knew, would contrive to keep the men on watch engaged until I had disposed of my burden. I picked up a coil of rope and made it fast to the dead man's neck, taking one turn of the rope round a boat davit. I pushed the thing over the rail. I intended to let go the rope the moment the weight attached to it was safely in the sea, and so lowered away silently, paying out the line without excessive strain owing to the support of the davit round which I had wound it. I had not to wait so long as that, for just as the body was dangling over the foaming wake of the steamer, a little streak of moonlight shot out from behind a bank of cloud, and lighted the vessel with a sudden gleam. I was startled by this and held on, fearing that some watching eye might see my curious movements. For a minute, I leaned over the rail and watched the track of the steamer as though I had come on deck for the air. There was a quick rush near the vessel's quarter. Something dark leaped out of the water, and there was a sharp snap, a crunch. The lower limbs were gone in the jaws of a shark. I let go the rope in horror, and the body dropped splashing into that hideous fishing ground. Sick to death, I turned away. Get below quickly, Edith Metford said in my ear. They heard the splash, slight as it was, and are coming this way. Her warning was nearly a sob. We hurried down the companion as fast as we dared and listened to the comments of the watch above. They were soon satisfied that nothing of importance had occurred and resumed their stations. Before we parted on that horrible night, Edith said in a trembling voice, You have done your work like a brave man. Say rather like a forger and murderer, I answered. No, she maintained. Many men before you have done much worse in a good cause. You are not a forger. You are a diplomat. You are not a murderer. You are a hero. But I, being new to this work of slaughter and deception, could only deprecate her sympathy and draw away. I felt that my very presence near her was pollution. I was unclean, and I told her that I was so. Whereupon, without hesitation, she put her arms round my neck and said, clinging close to me, You are not unclean. You are free from guilt. And, Arthur, I will kiss you now. End of chapter 14、Chapter、of the Crack of Doom. This is LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Greg Mullinson. The Crack of Doom by Robert Cromie. Chapter 15. If Not Too Late. When I came on deck next morning, the coast of Arabia was rising, a thin thread of a hazy blue between the laden grey of the sea and the soft grey of the sky. The morning was cloudy, and the blazing sun was veiled in atmospheric gauze. I had hardly put my foot on deck when Natalie Brand ran to meet me. I hang back guiltily. I thought you will never come. This is a dreadful news, she cried. I muttered some incoherent words, to which she did not attend, but went on hurriedly. Rockingham has thrown himself overboard in a hysterical fit, brought on by the heat. The sailors heard a splash. I know they did. This escaped me unawares, and I instantly prevaricated. I have been told about that. Do you know that Herbert is ill? I could have conscientiously answered this question affirmatively also. Her sudden sympathy for human misadventure jarred upon me, as it had done once before, when I thought of the ostensible objects of the cruise. I said harshly, Then Rockingham is at rest, and your brother is on the road to it. It was a brutal speech. It had a very different effect to that which I intended. True, she said, but think of the awful consequences if now that Rockingham is gone. Herbert should be seriously ill. I do think of it, I said stiffly. Indeed, I could hardly keep from adding that I had provided for it. You must come to him at once. I have faith in you. This gave me a twinge. I have no faith in Percival, the ship doctor. You are nursing your brother? I said with assumed carelessness. Of course. What is Percival giving him? She described the treatment, and as this was exactly what I myself would have prescribed to put my own previous interference right. I promised to come at once, saying, It is quite evident that Percival does not understand the case. This is exactly what I thought, Natalie agreed, leading me to Brand's cabin. I found vitality lower than I expected, and he was very impatient. The whole purpose of his life was at stake dependent on his preserving a healthy body, on which, in turn, a vigorous mind depends. How soon can you get me up? he asked sharply, when my pretended examination was over. I should say a month at most. This would be too long, he cried. You must do it in less. It does not depend on me. It does depend on you. I know life itself. You know the paltry science of organic life. I have had no time for such trivial study. Get me well within three days or... I am attending. By the hold over my sister's imagination, which I have gained, I will kill her on the fourth morning from now. You will... Not. I tell you I will. Brandt shrieked, starting up in his breath. I could do it now. You could not. Man, do you know what you are saying? You to bandy words with me? A cloud-brained fool to dare a man of science? Man of science forsooth? Your men of science are to me as brain-benumbed 
as brain bereaved as that fly which I crush. Thus, the buzzing insect was indeed dead. But I was something more than a fly. At last I was on the fair field with this scientific magician or madman. And on a fair field I was not afraid of him. You are agitating yourself unnecessarily and injuriously. I said in my best professional manner. And if you persist in doing so, you will make my one month three. In a voice of undisguised scorn, Brand exclaimed, without noticing my interruption, bearded by a creature whose little mind is to me like the open page of a book to read when the humor sighs me. Then with a fierce glance at me he cried, I have read your mind before, I can read it now. You can not. He threw himself back in his berth and strove to concentrate his mind. For nearly five minutes he lay quiet still, and then he said gently, You are right. Have you then a higher power than I? No, a lower. A lower? What do you mean? I mean that I have merely paralyzed your brain, that for many months to come it will not be restored to its normal power, that it will never reach its normal power again unless I choose. Then all is lost, 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 he wailed out. The end is far off and the journey as long and the way as hard, as if I had never striven, and the tribute of a human tears will be exacted to the uttermost. My life has been in vain. The absolute agony in his voice, the note of almost superhuman suffering and despair, was so intense that, without thinking, of what it was this man was grievering over, I found myself saying suitingly, No, no, nothing is lost. It is only your own overstrained nervous system which sends these fantastic nightmares to your brain. I will soon make you all right if you listen to reason. He turned to me with the most appealing look which I had ever seen in a human eyes, saved once before, when Natalie pleaded with me. I had forgotten, he said. The issue now lies in your hands. Choose rightly. Choose mercy. I will. I answered shortly, for his request brought me back with a jerk to his motive. Then you will get me well as soon as your skill can do it. I will keep you in your present condition until I have your most solemn assurance that you will neither go farther yourself nor instigate others to go farther with this preposterous scheme of yours. Bah! Brand ejaculated contemptuously and lay back with a sudden content. My brain is currently out of order, else I should have not forgotten. Until your words recalled it, the Labrador Expedition. The Labrador Expedition? Yes, on the day we sailed for the Arafura Sea, Gray started with another party for Labrador. If we fail to act before 31st December in the year 1900, he will proceed, and the end of the century will be the date of the end of the earth. I will signal to him now. His face changed suddenly. For a moment I thought he was dead. Then the dreadful fact came home to me. He was telegraphing telepathically to Gray. 
so the murder that was upon my soul had been done in vain. Then another life must be taken. Better a double crime than one resultless tragedy. I was spared this. Brand opened his eyes wearily and sighed as if fatigued. The effort, short as it was, must have been intense. He was prostrated. His voice was low, almost a whisper as he said. You have succeeded beyond belief. I cannot even signal him, much less exchange ideas. With that he turned his face from me and instantly fell into a deep sleep. I left the cabin and went on deck. As usual, it was fairly sprinkled over with the passengers, but owing to the strong headwind caused by the speed of the streamer, there was a little nook in the bow where there was no one to trouble me with unwelcome company. I sat down on an arm of the starboard anchor and tried to think. The game, which seemed so nearly won, had all to be played over again from the first move. If I had killed Brand, which surely would have been justifiable, the other expedition would go on from where he left off. And how would I find them? And who would believe my story when I go back to England? Bran must go on. His attempt to wreck the earth, even if the power he claimed were not overrated, would fail. For if the compounds of a common explosive must be so nicely balanced as they require to be, Surely the addition of the figures which I had made in his formula would upset the balance of constituents in an agent so delicate, though so powerful, as that which he had invented. When the master failed, it was more than probable that the pupil will distrust the invention and return to London for fresh experiments. Then a clean sweep must be made of the whole party. Meantime, it was plain that Brandt must be allowed the opportunity of failing, and this it would be my hazardous duty to superintend. I returned to Brandt's cabin with my mind made up. He was awake. He looked at me eagerly, but waited for me to speak. Our conversation was brief for I had little sympathy with my patient, and the only anxiety I experienced about his health was the hope that he would not die until he had served my purpose. I have decided to get you up, I said curtly. You have decided well, he answered with equal coldness. That was the whole interview on which so much depended. After this, I did not speak to Brandt on any subject but that of his symptoms, and before long he was able to come on deck. The month I spoke of as the duration of his illness was an intentional exaggeration on my part. Rockingham was forgotten with a sadness and completeness that was almost ghastly. The society claimed to have improved the old maxim to speak nothing of the dead, save what is good. Of the dead, they spoke not at all. It is called his creed, but in this instance it pleased me well. We did not touch at Aden, and I was glad of it. The few attractions of the place, the diving boys and the like, may be a relief in ordinary sea voyages but I was too much absorbed in my experiment on Brandt to bear with patience and delay which served to postpone the crisis of my scheme. I had treated him well, 
so far as his bodily health went, but I deliberately continued to tamper with his brain, so that any return of his telepathic power was thus prevented. Indeed, Brand himself was not anxious for such return. The power was always exercised as an extreme nervous strain, and it was now, he said, unnecessarily to his purpose. In consequence of this determination, I modified the already minute doses of the drug I was giving him. This soon told with advantage on his health. His physical improvement partly restored his confidence in me, so that he followed my instructions faithfully. He evidently recognized that he was in my power, that if I did not choose to restore him fully, no other man could. Of the ship's officers, Anderson, who was in command, and Percival, the doctor, were men of some individuality. The captain was a good sailor and an excellent man of business. In the first capacity he was firm, exacting and scrupulously conscientious. In the second, his conscience was more elastic when he saw his way clear to his own advantage. He had certain rigid rules of conduct, which he prided himself on observing to the letter, without for a moment suspecting that their reason d'etre lay in his own interest. His commercial morality only required him to keep within the law. His final contract with myself was, I admit, faithfully carried out, but the terms of it would not have discredited the most predatory businessman in London town. Percival was the opposite pole of a such a character. He was a clever man, who might have reason in his profession, but for his easy-going indolence. I spent many an hour in his cabin. He was a sportsman and a skilled raconteur. His anecdotes helped to while the weary time away. He exaggerated persistently, but this did not disturb me. Besides, if in his narratives he lengthened out the hunt a dozen miles and increased the weight of the fish to an impossible figure, made the brace a dozen and then ten-ton boat a man of war, it was not because he was deliberately untruthful. He looked back on his feats throughout the telescope of a strongly magnifying memory. It was more agreeable to me to hear him boast his powers than have him inquire after the health and treatment of my patient Brand. On this matter he was naturally very curious, and I very reticent. That Brand did not entirely trust me was evident from his confusion, when I surprised him once reading his formula his anxiety to convince me that it was only a commonplace memorandum was almost ludicrous. I was glad to see him anxious about that document. The more carefully he preserved it, and the more faithfully he adhered to his conditions, the better for my experiment. A sense of security followed this incident. It did not last long, it ended that evening. After a day of almost unendurable heat, I went on deck for a breath of air. We were all out in the Indian Ocean, and surroundings were being attempted by some of our naturalists. I sat alone and watched the sun sink down into the glossy ocean on which our rushing vessel was the only thing that moved. As the darkness of that hot, still night gathered, weird gleam of phosphorus broke from the streamer's bow and streamed away behind us in long lines of flashing spangles. 
where the swell caused by the passage of the ship rose in curling waves. These, as they splashed into mimic bricks, burst into showers of flamboyant lights. The water from the discharged pipe poured down in a cascade that shone like silver. Every turn of the screw dashed a thousand flashes on either side, and the having of the lead was like the flight of a meteor as it plunged with a luminous trail far down into the dark, unfathomable depth below. My name was spoken softly. Natalie Brandt stood beside me. The spell was complete. The unearthly glamour of the magical scene has been compassed by her. She had called it forth and could disperse it by an effort of her will. I wrenched my mind free from the foolish phantasmagoria. I have a good news, Natalie said in a low voice. Her tone were soft, musical, her manner caressing. Happiness was in her whole bearing, tenderness in her eyes. Dread oppressed me. Herbert is now well again. He has been well for some time. I said my heart beating fast. He is not thoroughly restored even yet. But this evening he was able to receive a message from me by the thought waves. He thinks you are plotting injury to him. His brain is not yet sufficiently strong to show how foolish this fugitive fancy is. Perhaps you would go to him. He is troubling himself over this. You can set his mind at rest. I can and will, if I'm not too late, I answered. End of chapter 15 Read by Greg Malinson Chapter 16 of The Crack of Doom this is LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Greg Malinson. The Crack of Doom by Robert Cromie. Chapter 16. 5,000 pounds to detain the ship. Brand was asleep when I entered his cabin. His writing table was covered with scraps of paper on which he had been scribbling. My name was on every scrap, proceeded or followed by unfinished sentence. Thus, Marcel is thinking. When I was ill, Marcel thought. Marcel means to. All this I gathered up carefully and put it in my pocket. Then I inoculated him with as strong a solution of the drug I was using on him as was compatible with the safety of his life. Immediate danger being thus averted, I determined to run no similar risk again. For many days after this our voyage was monotonous. The deadly secret shared by Edith Medford and myself drew us gradually nearer to each other as time passed. She understood me, or at least gave me the impression that she understood me. Little by little, that capricious mood which I have heard Ford described changed into one of enduring sympathy. With one trivial exception, this lasted until the end. But for her help my mind would hardly have stood the strain of events which were now at hand, whose livid shadows were projected in the rising fire of Brand's relentless eyes. Brand appeared to lose interest gradually in his ship's company. He became daily more and more absorbed in his own thoughts. Natalie was ever gentle, even tender. 
but I chafed at the impalpable barrier which was always between us. Sometimes I thought that she would willingly have ranged herself on my side. Some hidden power held her back. As to the others, I began to like the boy Halley. He was lovable, if not athletic. His devotion to Natalie, which never wanted, did not now trouble me. It was only a friendship, and I welcomed it. Had it been anything more, it was not likely that he would have prevailed against the will of a man who had done murder of his mistress. We steamed through the Malay archipelago, steering north, south, east, west, as if at haphazard, until only the navigating officers and the director of the society knew how our course lay. We were searching for an island about the bearings of which it transpired some mistakes have been made. I do not know whether the great laureate ever sailed this seas, but I know that his glorious islands of flowers and islands of fruits, with all their lucretious imagery, were here eclipsed by our own islands of foliage. The long lagoons, the deep blue bays, the glittering particolored fish that swim in visible shoals deep down amidst the submerged coral grooves over which we passed, the rich-toned seaweeds and brilliant anemones, the yellow strands and the steep cliffs, the riotous foliage that swept down from the sky to the blue of the sea. All these natural beauties seemed to cry to me with living voices, to me bound on a cruise of universal death. After a long spell of apparently aimless but glorious steaming, a small island was sighted on our port bow. The Esmeralda was steered directly for it, and we dropped anchor in a deep natural harbour on its southern shore. Preparations for landing had been going on during the day, and everything was ready for quitting the ship. It was here that my first opportunity for making use of the gold I had brought with me occurred. Anderson was called up by Brandt, who made him a short complimentary speech and finished it by ordering his officer to return to England, where further instructions would be given him. This order was received in respectful silence. Captain Anderson had been too liberally treated to the moor if the Esmeralda had been ordered to the South Pole. Brandt went below for a few minutes, and as soon as he had disappeared, I went forward to Anderson and hailed him nervously, for there was not a moment to spare. Anderson, I said hurriedly, you must have noticed that Mr. Brandt is an eccentric. Pardon me, sir, it is not my business to comment upon my owner. I did not ask you to comment upon him, sir, I said sharply. It is I who shall comment upon him, and it is up for you to say whether you will undertake to earn my money by waiting in this harbour till I am ready to sail back with you to England. Have you anything more to say, sir? Anderson asked stiffly. I presume I have said enough. If you have nothing more to say, I must ask you to leave the bridge, and if it were not that you are leaving the ship this moment, I would caution you not to be in impairment to me again. He blew his whistle and the steward ran forward. Johansson, see Mr. Marshall's luggage over the side at once. To me, he said shortly, Quit my ship, sir. This trivial show of temper, which indeed had been provoked by my own hasty speech, turned my impatience into fury. 
before I quit your ship, I said with emphasis. I will tell you how you yourself will quit it. You will do so between two policemen if you land in England, and between two marines if you think of keeping on the high seas. Before we started, I sent a detailed statement of this ship, the nature of this nefarious voyage, and the names of the passengers, or as many as I know, to a friend who will put it in the proper hands if anything befalls me. Go back without me and explain the loss of that French fishing fleet which was sunk the very night we sailed. It is an awkward coincidence to be explained by a man who returns from unknown voyage having lost his entire list of passengers. You cannot be aware of what this man Brand intends, or you would at least stand by us as long as your own safety permitted. In any case, you cannot safely return without us. Anderson, after reflecting for a moment, apologized for his peremptory words, and agreed to stand by night and day with fires banked until I and all whom I could prevail upon to return with me, got back to his vessel. There was no danger of his running short of coal. A ship that was practically an ocean liner in coal ballast would be a considerable time in burning out her own cargo. But he insisted on a large money payment in advance. I had foolishly mentioned that I had little over five thousand pound in a gold. This he claimed on the plea that, in duty to himself, a favorite phrase of his, he could not accept less. But I think his sense of duty was limited only by the fact that I had hardly another penny in the world. Under the circumstances, he may have waived all remuneration. As he was firm, and I had no time to haggle, I agreed to give him the money. Our bargain was only completed when Brand returned to the deck. It was strange that on an island like that on which we were landing, there should be a regular army of natives waiting to assist us with our baggage, and the saddled horses which were in readiness, were out of place in a primeval wilderness. An Englishman came forward, and saluting Brandt, said all was ready for the start of the hills. This explained the puzzle. An advance agent had made everything comfortable. For Brandt, his sister, and Miss Medford, the best appointed horses were selected. I, as physician to the chief, had one. The main body had to take the journey on foot, which they did by very easy stages, owning to the heat and the primitive track which formed the only road. Their journey was not very long, perhaps ten miles in a direct line. Mounted as we were, it was often necessary to stoop to escape the dense masses of parasitic growth which hang in a green festoons from every branch of the trees on either side. Under this thick shade all the riotous vegetation of the tropics had fought for life and struggled for light and air till the wealth of their luxuriant death had carpeted the underwood with a thick deposit of steaming foliage. As we ascended the height, every mile in distance brought changes in the botanical growth, which may have passed unnoticed by the ordinary observer or ignorant pioneer. All were noted and commented on by Brandt, whose eye was still as keen as his brain had once been brilliant. His usual state demeanor changed suddenly. He romped ahead of us like a schoolboy out for a holiday. 
Unlike a schoolboy, however, he was always seeking new items of knowledge and conveying them to us with unaffected pleasure. He was more like a master who had found new ground and new material for his class. Natalie gave herself up like him to this enjoyment of the moment. Edith Medford and I partly caught the glamour of their infectious good humour. But with both of us it was tempered by the knowledge of what was in store. When we arrived at our destination we dismounted, at Brand's request, and tied our horses to convenient branches. He went forward, and pushing aside the underwood with both hands, mentioned to us to follow him till he stopped on a ledge of rocks which overtopped a hollow in the mountain. The gorge below was the most beautiful glade I ever looked upon. It was a paradise of foliage. Here and there a fallen tree has formed a picturesque bridge over the mountain stream which meandered through it. Far down below there was a waterfall where gorgeous three fern rose in natural bowers, while others further still leaned over the lotus-covered stream, their giant leaves trailing in the slow-moving current. Tangled mess of bricken rioted in wild abundance over a velvety green sod, overshadowed by waving magnolias. Through the trees, bright plumaged birds were flitting from branch to branch in songless flight, flashing their brilliant colors through the sun leaves. In places, the water splashed over moss grown rocks into deep pools. Every drifting spray of cloud threw over the dell a new light deepening the shadows under the great ferns. It was here, in this glorious fairyland, here upon this island, where before us no white foot had ever trod, whose nameless people represented the simplest type of human existence, that Herbert Brandt was to put his devilish experiment to the proof. I marvel at that he should have selected so fair a spot for so terrible a purpose. But the papers which I found later amongst the men's effects on the Esmeralda explained much that was then incomprehensible to me. Our camp was quickly formed and our life was outwardly as happy as if we had been an ordinary company of tourists. I said outwardly, because while we walked and climbed and collected specimens of botanical or geological interest, there remained that latent dread which always followed us, and dominated the most frivolous of our people, on all of whom a new solemnity had fallen. For myself, the fact that the hour of trial of my own experiment was daily drawing closer and more inevitable was sufficient to account for my constant and extreme anxiety. Brand joined none of our excursions. He was always at work in his improvised laboratory. The boxes of material which had been brought from the ship nearly filled it from floor to roof, and from the speed with which these were emptied, it was evident that their contents had been systematized before shipment. In place of the varied collections of substances, there grew up within the room a cone of compound matter in which all were blended. This cone was smaller, Brand admitted, than what he had intended. The supply of subordinate fulminates, though several times greater than what was required, 
provide to be considerably short. But as he had allowed himself a large margin, everything began on a scale far exceeding the minimum, which his calculations had pointed to as sufficient. This deficiency did not cause him more than a temporary annoyance, so he worked on. When we had been three weeks on the island, I found the suspense greater than I could bear. The crisis was at hand and my heart failed me. I determined to make a last appeal to Natalie, to fly with me to the ship. Edith Medford would accompany us. The rest might take the risk to which they had consented. I found Natalie standing on the high rock whence the most lovely view of the dell could be obtained, and as I approached her silently, she was not aware of my presence until I laid my hand on her shoulder. Natalie, I said wistfully, for the girl's eyes were full of tears, do you mind if I withdraw now from this enterprise, in which I cannot be of the slightest use? and of which I most heartily disapprove? The society would not allow you to withdraw. You cannot do so without its permission, and hope to live within a thousand miles of it, she answered gravely. I should not care to live within ten thousand miles of it. I should try to get and keep the earth diameter between myself and it. She looked up with an expression of such pain that my heart smote me. How about me? I cannot live without you now, she said softly. Don't live without me. Come with me. Get rid of this infamous association of lunatics, whose object they themselves cannot really appreciate, and whose means are murder. But there she stopped me. My brother could find me out at the uttermost end of the earth if I forsook him, and you know I do not mean to forsake him. For yourself, do not try to desert. It would make no difference. Do not believe that any consideration would cause me willingly to give you a moment's pain, or that I should shrink from sacrificing myself to save you. With one of her small, white hands, she gently pressed my hand towards her. Her lips touched my forehead, and she whispered, Do not leave me. It will soon be over now. I... I need you. As I was returning dejected after my fruitless appeal to Natalie, I met Edith Medford, to whom I had unhappily mentioned my proposal for an escape. Is it arranged? When do we start? She asked eagerly. It is not arranged, and we do not start, I answered in despair. You told me you would go with her or without her, she cried passionately. It is shameful, unmanly. It is certainly both if I really said what you tell me. I was not myself at the moment, and my tongue must have slandered me. I stay to the end. But you will go. Captain Anderson will receive you. How am I to be certain of that? I paid him for your passage and half his receipt. And you really think I would go and leave... leave... Natalie, I think you would be perfectly justified. At this, the girl stamped her foot passionately on the ground and burst into tears nor would she permit any of the slightest caresses I offered. I thought her old caprices were returning. She flung my arms rudely from her and left me bewildered. End of chapter 16 Read by Greg Malinson Chapter 17 of the Crack of Doom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michael Broomhill. The Crack of Doom by Robert Cromie. This Earth Shall Die. My memory does not serve me well in the scenes which immediately preceded the closing of the drama in which Brand was chief actor. It is doubtless the transcendental interest of the final situation which blunts my recollection of what occurred shortly before it. I did not abate one jot of my determination to fight my venture out unflinching, but my actions were probably more automatic than reasoned, as the time of our last encounter approached. On the whole, the fight had been a fair one. Brand had used his advantage over me for his own purpose as long as it remained with him. I used the advantage as soon as it passed to me for mine. The conditions had thus been equalized when, for the third and last time, I was to hear him address his society. This time the man was weak in health. His vitality was ebbing fast, but his marvelous inspiration was strong within him, and, supported by it, he battled manfully with the disease which I had manufactured for him. His lecture room was the fairy glen, his canopy the heavens. I cannot give the substance of his address, or any portion of it, verbatim, as on former occasions, for I have not the manuscript. I doubt if Brand wrote out his last speech. Methodical as were his habits, it is probable that his final words were not premeditated. They burst from him in a delirium that could hardly have been studied. His fine frenzy could not well have originated from considered sentences, although his language, regarded as mere oratory, was magnificent. It was appalling in the light through which I read it. He stood alone upon the rock which overtopped the dell. We arranged ourselves in such groups as suited our inclinations upon some rising ground below. The great trees waved overhead, low, murmuring. The waterfall splashed drearily. Below, not a whisper was exchanged. Above, the man poured out his triumphant death song in sonorous periods. Below, great fear was upon all. Above, the madman exulted wildly. At first, his voice was weak. As he went on, it gained strength and depth. He alluded to his first address in which he had hinted that the material universe was not quite a success, to his second, in which he had boldly declared it was an absolute failure. This, his third declaration, was to tell us that the remedy as far as he, a mortal man, could apply it, was ready. The end was at hand. That night should see the consummation of his life work. Tomorrow's sun would rise, if it rose at all, on the earth restored to space. A shiver passed perceptibly over the people, prepared as they were for this long, foreseen announcement. Edith Metford, who stood by me on my left, slipped her hand in mine and pressed my fingers hard. Natalie Brand, on my right, did not move. Her eyes were dilated and fixed on the speaker. The old clairvoyant look was on her face. Her dark pupils were blinded, save to the inward light. She was either unconscious or only partially conscious. Now that the hour had come, they who had believed their courage secure felt it wither. They, the people with us, begged for a little longer time to brace themselves for the great crisis, the plunge into an eternity from which there would be no resurrection, neither of matter nor of mind. Brand heeded them not. This night, said he with culminating enthusiasm, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples shall dissolve. To this great globe itself, this paltry speck of less account in space than a dewdrop in an ocean, and all its sorrow and pain, its trials and temptations, all the pathos and bathos of our tragic human farce, the end is near. The way has been hard, and the journey over long, and the burden often beyond man's strength. But that long-drawn sorrow now shall cease. The tears will be wiped away. The burden will fall from our weary shoulders, for the fullness of time has come. 
This earth shall die, and death is peace. I stand, he cried out in a strident voice, raising his arm aloft. I may say, with one foot on sea and one on land, for I hold the elemental secret of them both, and I swear by the living God, science incarnate, that the suffering of the centuries is over, that for this earth and all it contains, from this night and forever, time will be no more. A great cry rose from the people. Give us another day, only another day. But Brand made answer. It is now too late. Too, too late, late, the people wailed. Yes, too late. I warned you long ago. Are you not yet ready? In two hours, the disintegrating agent will enter on its work. No human power could stop it now. Not if every particle of the material I have compounded were separated and scattered to the winds. Before I set my foot upon this rock, I applied the key which will release its inherent energy. I myself am powerless. Powerless, powerless sobbed the auditors. Powerless, and if I had 10,000 times the power which I have called forth from the universal element, I would use it towards the issue I have forecast. Thereupon he turned away. Doom sounded in his words. The hand of death laid clammy fingers on us. Edith Medford's strength failed at last. It had been sorely tested. She sank into my arms. Courage, true heart. Our time has come, I whispered. We start for the steamer at once. The horses are ready. My arrangements had been already made. My plan had been as carefully matured as any ever made by Brand himself. How many horses? Three. One for you, another for Natalie, the third for myself. The rest must accept the fate they have selected. The girl shuddered as she said, But your interference with the formula, are you sure it will destroy the effect? I am certain that the particular result on which Brand calculates will not take place. But short of that, he has still enough explosive matter stored to cause an earthquake. We are not safe within a radius of 50 miles. It will be a race against time. Natalie will not come. Not voluntarily. You must think of some plan. Your brain is quick. We have not a moment to lose. Ah, there she is. Speak to her. Natalie was crossing the open ground which led from the glen to Brand's laboratory. She did not observe us till Edith called to her. Then she approached hastily and embraced her friend with visible emotion. Even to me, she offered her cheek without reserve. Natalie, I said quickly, there are three horses saddled and waiting in the palm grove. The Esmeralda is still lying in the harbor where we landed. You will come with us. Indeed, you have no choice. You must come if I have to carry you to your horse and tie you to the saddle. You will not force me to put that indignity upon you. To the horses then, come. For answer, she called her brother loudly by his name. Brand immediately appeared at the door of his laboratory, and when he perceived from whom the call had come, he joined us. Herbert, said Natalie, our friend is deserting us. He must still cling to the thought that your purpose may fail, and he expects to escape on horseback from the fate of the earth. Reason with him yet a little further. There is no time to reason, I interrupted. The horses are ready. This girl, pointing as I spoke to Edith Metford, takes one, I another, and you the third, whether your brother agrees or not. Surely you have not lost your reason. Have you forgotten the drop of water in the English Channel? Brand said quietly. Brand, I answered. The sooner you induce your sister to come with me, the better and the sooner you induce these maniac friends of yours to clear out the better, for your enterprise will fail. It is certain as the law of gravitation. With my own hand, I mix the ingredients according to the formula. And, said I, with my own hand, I altered your formula. Had Brand's heart stopped beating, his face could not have become more distorted and livid. He moved close to me, and glaring into my eyes, hissed out, you altered my formula? I did, I answered recklessly. I multiplied your figures by ten where they struck me as insufficient. When? I strode closer still to him and looked him straight in the eyes while I spoke. That night in the Red Sea, when Edith Metford, by accident, mixed morphia in your medicine, 
the night I injected a subtle poison, which I picked up in India once, into your blood while you slept, thereby baffling some of the functions of your extraordinary brain. The night when in your sleep you stirred once, and had you stirred twice, I would have killed you then and there, as ruthlessly as you would kill mankind now. The night I did kill your lieutenant, rocking him, and throw his body overboard to the sharks. Brand did not speak for a moment. Then he said in a gentle, uncomplaining voice, So, it now devolves on Gray. The end will be the same. The Labrador expedition will succeed where I have failed. To Natalie, you had better go. There will only be an explosion. The island will probably disappear. That will be all. Do you remain? She asked. Yes, I perish with my failure. Then I perish with you. And you, Marcel, save yourself, you coward. I started as if struck in the face. Then I said to Edith, be careful to keep to the track. Take the bay horse. I saddled him for myself, but you can ride him safely. Lose no time and ride hard for the coast. Arthur Marcel, she answered so softly that the others did not hear. Your work in the world is not yet over. There is the Labrador expedition. Just now, when my strength failed, you whispered, courage. Be true to yourself. Half an hour is gone. At length, some glimmer of human feeling awoke in Brand. He said in a low, abstracted voice, My life fittingly ends now. To keep you, Natalie, would only be a vulgar murder. The old willpower seemed to come back to him. He looked into the girl's eyes, said slowly and sternly, Go. I command it. Without another word, he turned away from us. When he had disappeared into the laboratory, Natalie sighed and said dreamily, I am ready. Let us go. End of chapter 17Chapter 18 of The Crack of Doom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michael Broomhill. The Crack of Doom by Robert Cromie. The Flight. I led the girls hurriedly to the horses. When they were mounted on the ponies, I gave the bridle reins of the bay horse, whose size and strength were necessary for my extra weight, to Edith Medford, and asked her to wait for me until I announced Brand's probable failure to the people, and advised a sabe coupe. Hard upon my warning, there followed a strange metamorphosis in the crowd who, after the passing weakness at the lecture, had fallen back into stoical indifference, or it may have been despair. The possibility of escape galvanized them into the desire for life. Cries of distress and prayers for help filled the air. Men and women rushed about like frightened sheep without concert or any sensible effort to escape, wasting in futile scrambles the short time remaining to them. For another half hour had passed, and in sixty minutes the earthquake would take place. Follow us, I shouted, as with my companions I rode slowly through the camp. Keep the track to the sea. I shall have the steamer's boats ready for all who may reach the shore alive. The horses! Seize the horses! rose in a loud shout, and the mob flung themselves upon us, as though three animals would carry all. When I saw the rush, I called out, Sit firm, Natalie. I'm going to strike your horse. Saying which, I struck the pony a sharp blow with my riding whip crossways on the flank. It bounded like a deer and then dashed forward down the rough pathway. Now you, Edith. I struck her pony in the same way, but it only reared and nearly threw her. It could not get away. Already hands were upon both bridle reins. There was no help for it. I pulled out my revolver and fired once, twice, and thrice, for I missed the second shot, and then the maddened animal sprang forward, released from the hands that held it. It was now time to look to myself. I was in the midst of a dozen maniacs, mad with fear. I kicked in my spurs desperately, 
and the bay lashed out his hind feet. One hoof struck young Halley in the forehead. He fell back dead, his skull in fragments. But the others refused to break the circle. Then I emptied my weapon on them, and my horse plunged through the opening, followed by despairing execrations. The moment I was clear, I returned my revolver to its case and settled myself in the saddle, for born out of the proper path as I had been, there was a stiff bank to leap before I could regain the track to the shore. Owing to the darkness, the horse refused to leap, and I nearly fell over his head. With a little scrambling, I managed to get back into my seat, and then trotted along the bank for a hundred yards. At this point, the bank disappeared, and there was nothing between me now and the open track to the sea. Once upon the path, I put the bay to a gallop, and very soon overtook a man and a woman hurrying on. They were running hand in hand, the man a little in front dragging his companion on by force. It was plain to me that the woman could not hold out much longer. The man, Claude Leroux, hailed me as I passed. Help us, Marcel. Don't ride away from us. I cannot save both, I answered, pulling up. Then save Mademoiselle Varey. I'll take my chance. This blunt speech moved me, the more especially as the man was French. I could not allow him to point the way of duty to me, an Englishman. A sister up then. Now, mademoiselle, put your arms around me and hold hard for your life. Luro, you may hold my stirrup if you agree to loose it when you tire. I will do so, he promised. Hampered thus, I but slowly gained on Natalie and Edith, whose ponies had galloped a mile before they could be stopped. Forward, forward, I shouted when within hail. Don't wait for me. Ride on at top speed. Lash your ponies with the bridle reins. We were all moving on now at an easy canter, for I could not go fast so long as Leroux held my stirrup, and the girls in front did not seem anxious to leave me far behind. Besides the tangled underwood and overhanging creepers rendered hard riding both difficult and dangerous. The ponies were hard held, but notwithstanding this, my horse fell back gradually in the race and the hammering of the hoofs in front grew fainter. The breath of the runner at my stirrup came in great sobs. He was suffocating, but he struggled on a little longer. Then he threw up his hand and gasped. I am done. Go on, Marcel. You deserve to escape. Don't desert the girl. May God desert me if I do, I answered. And do you keep on as long as you can. You may reach the shore after all. Go on, save her, he gasped, and then, from sheer exhaustion, fell forward on his face. Sit still, mademoiselle, I cried, pulling the French girl's arms around me in time to prevent her from throwing herself purposely from the horse. Then I drove in my spurs hard, and being now released from Leroux's grasp, I overtook the ponies. For five minutes we all rode on abreast. And then the darkness began to break, and a strange dawn glimmered over the treetops, although the hour of midnight was still to come. A wild red light, like that of a fiery sunset in a hazy summer evening, spread over the night sky. The quivering stars grew pale. Constellation after constellation, they were blotted out until the whole arc of heaven was a dull red glare. The horses were dismayed by this strange phenomenon and dashed the froth from their foaming muzzles as they galloped now without stress of spur at their best speed. Birds that could not sing found voice and chattered and shrieked as they dashed from tree to tree in aimless flight. Enormous bats hurled in the air, blinded by the unusual light. From the dense undergrowth, strange denizens of the woods, disturbed in their nightly prowl, leaped forth and scurried, squealing between the galloping hoofs, reckless of anything save their own fear. Everything that was alive upon the island was in motion, and fear was the motor of them all. So far, we saw no natives. Their absence did not surprise me, for I had no time for thought. It was explained later. Edith Metford's pony soon became unmanageable in its fright. I unbuckled one spur and gave it to her, directing her to hold it in her hand for of course she could not strap it to her boot, and drive it into the animal when he swerved. She took the spur, and as her pony, in one of its side leaps, nearly bounded off the path, she struck him hard on the ribs. He bolted and flew on far ahead of us. The light grew stronger. But that the rays were red, it would now have been as bright as day. 
We were chasing our shadows, so the light must be directly behind us. Mademoiselle Veret first noticed this and drew my attention to it. I looked back, and my heart sank at the sight. In the terror it inspired, I regretted having burdened myself with a girl I had sworn to save. The island was on fire. It is the end of the world, Mademoiselle Veret said with a shudder. She clung closer to me. I could feel her warm breath upon my cheek. The unmanly regret, which for a moment had touched me, passed. The ponies now seemed to find out that their safety lay in galloping straight on, rather than in scared leaps from side to side. They stretched themselves like racehorses and gave my bay, with his double burden, a strong lead. The pace became terrible considering the nature of the ground we covered. At last the harbor came in view, but my horse, I knew, could not last another mile, and the shore was still distant two or three. I spurred him hard and drew nearly level with the ponies, so that my voice could be heard by both their riders. Ride on, I shouted, and hail the steamer, so that there may be no delay when I come up. This horse is blown and will not stand the pace. I am going to ease him. You will go on board at once and send the boat back for us. Then I eased the bay, but in spite of this, I immediately overtook Edith Metford, who had pulled up. My reproaches she cut short by saying, If that horse does the distance at all, it will be by getting a lead all the way, and I am going to give it to him. So we started together. Natalie was waiting for us a little further on. I spoke to her, but she did not answer. From the moment that Brand had commanded her to accompany us, her manner had remained absolutely passive. What I ordered, she obeyed. That was all. Instead of being alarmed by the horrors of the ride, she did not seem to be even interested. I had not leisure, however, to reflect on this. For the first time in the whole race, she spoke to us. Would it not be better if Edith rode on? She said. I can take her place. It seems useless to sacrifice her. It does not matter to me. I cannot now be afraid. I am afraid, but I remain, Edith said resolutely. The ground under us began to heave. Whole areas of it swayed disjointed. We were galloping on oscillating fragments, which trembled beneath us like floating logs under boys at play. To jump these cracks, sometimes an upward bank, Sometimes a deep drop, in addition to the width of the seam, had to be taken, pumped out the failing horses, and the hope that was left to us disappeared utterly. The glare of the red light behind waxed fiercer still, and a low rumbling, as of distant thunder, began to mutter round us. The air became difficult to breathe. It was no longer air, but a mephitic stench that choked us with disgusting fumes. Then a great shock shook the land, and right in front of us a seam opened that must have been fully fifteen feet in width. Natalie was the first to see it. She observed it too late to stop. In the same mechanical way as she had acted before, she settled herself in the saddle, struck the pony with her hand, and raced him at the chasm. He cleared it with little to spare. Edith's took it next with less. Then my turn came. Before I could shake up my tired horse, Mademoiselle Varey said quickly, Monsieur has done enough. He will now permit me to alight. This time the horse cannot jump over with both. He shall jump over with both, Mademoiselle, or he shall jump in, I answered. Don't look down when we are crossing. The horse just got over, but he came to his knees, and we fell forward over his shoulder. The girl's head struck full on a slab of rock, and a faint moan was all that told me she was alive, as I arose half-stunned to my feet. My first thought was for the horse, for on him all depended. He was uninjured, apparently, but hardly able to stand from the shock and the stress of fatigue. Edith Metford had dismounted and caught him. She was holding the bridle in her left hand and winced as if in pain when I accidentally brushed against her right shoulder. I tied the horse to a young palm and begged the girl to ride on. She obeyed me reluctantly. Natalie had to assist her to remount, so she must have been injured. When I saw her safely in her saddle, I ran back to Mademoiselle Varey. The chasm was fast widening. From either side, great fragments were breaking off and falling in, with a roar of loose rocks crashing together, till far down the sound was dulled into a hollow boom. This ended in low guttural, which growled up from the abysmal depth. 
Mademoiselle Varey, or her dead body, lay now on the very edge of the seam, and I had to harden my heart before I could bring myself to venture close to it. But I had given my word, and there were no conditions in the promise when I made it. I was spared the ordeal. Just as I stepped forward, the slab of rock on which the girl lay broke off in front of me, and tipping up, overturned itself into the chasm. Far below I could see the shimmer of the girl's dress as her body went plunging down into that awful pit. And remembering her generous courage and offer of self-sacrifice, I felt tears rise in my eyes. But there was no time for tears. I leaped on the bay and got him into something approaching a gallop, shouting at the others to keep on, for they were now returning. When I came up with them, Edith Medford said with a shiver, The girl is at the bottom of the pit. Right on. We gained the shore at last, and our presence there produced the explanation of the absence of the natives on the pathway to the sea. They were there before us, lying prostrate on the beach in hundreds. They raised their bodies partly from the sands, like a resurrection of the already dead, and there then rang out upon the night air a sound such as my ears had never before heard in my life, such as, I pray God, they may never listen to again. I do not know what that dreadful death wail meant in words, only that it touched the lowest depths of human horror. All along the beach that fearful chorus of the damned wailed forth and echoed back from rock and cliff. The cry for mercy could not be mistaken. The supplication blended with despair. They were praying to us, their evil spirits, for this wrong had been wrought them by our advent, if not by ourselves. I cannot dwell upon the scene. I could not describe it. I would not if I could. The steamer was still in her berth. Her head was pointed seawards. Loud orders rang over the water. The roar of the chain running out through the hoss hole and the heavy splash could not be mistaken. Anderson had slipped his cable. Then the chime of the telegraph on the bridge was followed almost instantly by the first smashing stroke of the propeller. The Esmeralda was under way. End of chapter 18。Chapter 19 of The Crack of Doom。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Crack of Doom by Robert Cromie. Chapter 19 The Catastrophe. The Esmeralda was putting out to sea when I thought of a last expedient to draw the attention of her captain. Filling my revolver with cartridges, which I had loose in my pockets, I fired all the chambers as fast as I could snap the trigger. My signals were heard, and Anderson proved true to his bargain. He immediately reversed his engines, and when he had backed in as close as he thought safe, sent a boat ashore for us. We got into it without any obstruction from the cowering natives, who only shrank from us in horror. Now that their prayers had failed to move us. The moment our boat was made fast to the steamer's davit ropes and we were pulled out of the water, full speed ahead was rung from the bridge. We were raised to the deck while the vessel was getting up speed. I crawled up the ladder to the bridge feebly, for I was becoming stiff from the bruises of the fall from my horse. Anderson received me coldly and listened indifferently to my thanks. An agreement such as ours hardly prepared me for his loyalty. Oh, As to that, he interrupted, when I make a bargain, my word is my bond. On this occasion, I am inclined to think the indenture will be a final one. His bargain was a hard one, but having made it, he abided faithfully by his conditions. He was honest, therefore, in his own way. How far can he get out in fifteen minutes? I asked. We may make six or seven knots, but what is the good of that? There will be an earthquake on that island on a liberal scale. On such a scale that the ship would have very little chance in the wave that will follow us if we were fifty miles at sea. You have taken every precaution, of course. Anderson here looked at me contemptuously, and with an air of sarcastic admiration he said, You have guessed it at the first try. That is precisely what I have done. Pasha, don't take offense at trifles at the time like this, I said testily. If you knew as much about earthquakes as I do, you would be in no humor for bandying phrases. Might I ask how much you do know about it? 
you could not have foreseen the trouble more clearly if you had made it yourself. I did not make it myself, but I know the means which the man who did employed, and but for me that earthquake would have wrecked this earth. Anderson made no direct answer to this, but he said earnestly, You will go now below, sir. You are done up. Roberts will take you to the doctor. I am not done up, and I mean to see it out, I retorted doggedly. My nervous system was completely unhinged, and a fit of stupid obstinacy came on me which rendered any interference with my actions intolerable. Then you cannot see it out upon my bridge, Anderson said. The determined tone in which he spoke only added to my impotent wrath. Very well, I will return to the deck, and if any of your men should attempt to interfere with me, he will do so at his peril. With that, I swung my revolver round so as to have it ready in my hand. I was beside myself. My conduct was already bad enough, but I made it worse before I left the bridge. And if you, Anderson, disobey my orders, my orders, do you hear? An explosion such as took place in the middle of the English Channel shall take place in the middle of this ship. For God's sake, leave the bridge. I want my wits about me, and I have no intention of earning another exhibition of your devilries. Then be careful not to trouble me again. Thus, after having passed through much danger with a spirit not unbecoming, as I hope, an English gentleman, I acted, when the worst was past, like a peevish schoolboy. I am ashamed of my conduct in this small matter, and trust it will pass without much notice in the narrative of events of greater moment. On deck, Natalie Brand, Edith Medford, and Percival were standing together, their eyes fixed on the island. Edith's face was deathly white, even in the ruddy glow which was now over land and sea. When I saw her pallor, my evil temper passed away. It would be impossible for you to be quite well, I said to her anxiously, but has anything happened since I left you? You are very pale. Oh no, she answered. I am all right. A little faint after that ride. I shall be better soon. Natalie turned her weird eyes on me, instead of that hollow voice we had heard once before, when she spoke to us on the island. That is her way of telling you that your horse broke her right arm when she caught him for you. She held him, you remember, with her left hand. The doctor has set the limb. She will not suffer long. Heaven help us this awful night, Edith cried. How do you know that, Natalie? I know much now, but I shall know more soon. After this, she would not speak again. With every pound of steam on that the Esmeralda's boilers would bear without bursting, we were now plunging through the great rollers of the Aphra Sea. Everything had indeed been done to put the vessel in trim. She was cleared for action, so to speak, and a gallant fight she made when the issue was knit. When the hour of midnight must be near at hand, I looked at my watch. It was one minute to twelve o'clock. Thirty seconds more. The stupendous corona of flame which hung over the island was pierced by long lines of smoke that stretched far above the glare and clutched with sooty fingers at the stars, now fitfully coming back to view at our distance. The rumbling of eternal thunder waxed louder. Fifteen seconds now. Fearful peers rent the atmosphere. Vast tongues of flame protruded heavenward. The elements must be melting in that fervent heat. The blazing bowels of the earth were pouring forth. Twelve. Midnight. A reverberation thundered out which shook the solid earth, and a roaring hell breath of flame and smoke belched up so awful in its dread magnificence that every man who saw it and lived to tell his story might justly have claimed to have seen perdition. In that hurricane of incandescent matter, the island was blotted out forever from the map of this world. Notwithstanding the speed of the Esmeralda, she was a sloth when compared with the speed of the wave from such an earthquake. From the glare of the illumination to perfect darkness, the contrast was sudden and extreme. But the blackness of the ocean was soon whitened by the snowy plumes of the avalanche of water which was now racing us, far astern as yet, but gaining fast. I, 
who had no business about the ship requiring my presence in any special part, decided to wait on deck and lash myself to the forward, which would be practically the lee side of a deck house. Edith Mefford, we prevailed to go on below, that she might not run the risk of further injury to her fractured arm. As she left us, she whispered to me, So Natalie will be with you at the end, and I... A sob stopped her, and it came into my mind at that moment that this girl had acted very nobly, and that I had heartily appreciated her and all that she had done for me. Natalie refused to leave the deck. I lashed her securely beside me. Together, we awaited the end. When the roar of the following wave came close, so close that the voices of the officers of the ship could no longer be heard, Natalie spoke. The hollow sound was no longer in her voice. Her own sweet tones had come back. Arthur, she asked, is this the end? I fear it is, I answered, speaking close to her ear so that she might hear. Then we have little time, and I have something which I must say which you must promise me to remember when, when I am no longer with you. You will always be here with me while we live. I think I deserve that at last. Yes, you deserve that and more. I will be with you while I live, but that will not be for long. I was about to interrupt her when she put her soft little hand upon my lips and said, Listen, there is very little time. It is all a mistake. I mean, Herbert was wrong. He might as well have let me have my earthly span of happiness or folly. Call it what you will. You see that now, thank God. Yes, but I did see it too late. I did not know until, until I was dead. Hush! Again I tried to interrupt her, for I thought her mind was wandering. I died psychically with Herbert. That was when we first saw the light on the island. Since then I have lived mechanically but it has only been life in so low a form that I do not know what has happened between that time and this. And I could not now speak as I am, speaking save by a willpower which is costing me very dear. But it is the only voice you could hear. I do not therefore count the cost. My brother's brain so far overmatched my own that it first absorbed and finally destroyed my mental vitality. This influence removed, I am a rudderless ship at sea, bound to perish. May his torments endure forever. May the nethermost pit of hell receive him, I said with a groan of agony. But Natalie said, hush. I might have lingered on a little longer, but I have chose to concentrate the vital force which would have lasted me a few more senile years into the minutes necessary for this message for me to you a message I could not have given you if you were not dead. And I am dying so that you may hear it. Dying, my God, I am already dead. She seemed to struggle against some force that battled with her, and the roar of many waters was louder around us before she was able to speak again. Bend lower, Arthur. My strength is failing, and I have not yet said that for which I am here. Lower still. I said it is all a mistake. A hideous mistake. Existence as we know it is ephemeral. Suffering is ephemeral. There is nothing everlasting but love. There is nothing eternal but mind. Your mind is mine. Your love is mine. Your human life may belong to whomsoever you will it. It ought to belong to that brave girl below. I do not begrudge it to her, for I have you. We two shall be together through the ages, forever and ever. Heart of my heart, you have striven manfully and well, and if you did not altogether succeed in saving my flesh from premature corruption, be satisfied in that you have my soul. Ah. She pressed her hands to her head as if in dreadful pain. When she spoke again, her voice came in short gasps. My brain is reeling. I do not know what I am saying, she cried, distraught. I do not know whether I am saying what is true or only what I imagine to be true. I know nothing but this. I was mesmerized. I have been so for two years. But for that, I would have been happy in your love. For I was a woman before this hideous influence benumbed me. They told me it was only a fool's paradise that I missed. But I only know that I have missed it. Missed it, and the darkness of death is upon me. 
she ceased to speak. A shudder convulsed her, and then her head sank gently on my shoulder. At that moment the great wave broke over the vessel, whirling her helpless like a cork on the ripples of a mill pond, lashing her with mighty strokes, sweeping in giant cataracts from stem to stern, smashing, tearing everything, deluging her with hissing torrents, crushing her with avalanches of raging foam. And then the ocean tornado passed on and left the Esmeralda behind, with half the crew disabled and many lost, her decks a mass of wreckage, her masts gone. The crippled ship barely floated. When the last torrent of spray passed and I was able to look to Natalie, her head had drooped down on her breast. I raised her face gently and looked into her wide open eyes. She was dead. End of chapter 19. Chapter 20 of The Crack of Doom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Roger Moline. The Crack of Doom by Robert Cromey. Conclusion Taking up my girl's body in my arms, I stumbled over the wreck encumbered deck and bore it to the stateroom she had occupied on the outward voyage. Percival was too busy attending to wounded sailors to be interrupted. His services, I knew, were useless now, but I wanted him to refute or corroborate a conviction which my own medical knowledge had forced upon me. The thought was so repellent I clung to any hope which might lead to its dispersion. I waited alone with my dead. Percival came after an hour, which seemed to me an eternity. He stammered out some incoherent words of sympathy as soon as he looked in my face. But this was not the purpose for which I had detached him from his pressing duties elsewhere. I made a gesture towards the dead girl. He attended to it immediately. I watched closely and took care that the light should be on his face so that I might read his eyes rather than listen to his words. "'She has fainted!' he exclaimed as he approached the rigid figure. I said nothing until he turned and faced me. Then I read his eyes. He said slowly, "'You are aware, Marcel, that, that she is dead?' "'I am.' "'That she has been dead several hours?' "'I am. "'But let me think. It was only an hour—' "'No, do not think.' I interrupted. There are things in this voyage which will not bear to be thought of. I thank you for coming so soon. You will forgive me for troubling you when you have so much to do elsewhere. And now leave us alone. I mean, leave me alone. He pressed my hand and went away without a word. I am that man's friend. They buried her at sea. I was happily unconscious at the time, and so was spared that scene. Edith Metford, weak and suffering as she was, went through it all. She has told me nothing about it, save that it was done. More than that I could not bear, and I have borne much. The voyage home was a dreary episode. There is little more to tell, and it must be told quickly. Percival was kind, but it distressed me to find that he now plainly regarded me as weak-minded from the stress of my trouble. Once, in the extremity of my misery, I began a relation of my adventures to him, for I wanted his help. The look upon his face was enough for me. I did not make the same mistake again. To Anderson I made amends for my extravagant display of temper. He received me more kindly than I expected. I no longer thought of the money that had passed between us. And, to do him tardy justice, I do not think he thought of it either. At least he did not offer any of it back. His scruples, I presume, were conscientious. Indeed, I was no longer worth a man's enmity. Sympathy was now the only dignity that could be put upon me. 
and Anderson did not trespass in that direction. My misery was, I thought, complete. One note must still be struck in that long discord of despair. We were streaming along the southern coast of Java. For many hours the rugged cliffs and giant rocks, which fence the island against the onslaught of the Indian Ocean, had passed before us in review, and we, Edith Metford and I, sat on the deck silently, with many thoughts in common, but without the interchange of a spoken word. The stern, forbidding aspect of that iron coast increased the gloom which had settled on my brain. Its ramparts of lonely sea-drenched crags depressed me below the mental zero that was now habitual with me. The sun went down in a red glare which moved me not. The short twilight passed quickly, but I noticed nothing. Then night came. The restless sea disappeared in darkness. The grand march past of the silent stars began, but I neither knew nor cared. A soft whisper stirred me. Arthur, for God's sake, rouse yourself. You are brooding a great deal too much. It will destroy you. Listlessly I put my hand in hers and clasped her fingers gently. "'Bear with me,' I pleaded. "'I will bear with you forever. But you must fight on. You have not won yet.' "'No, nor ever shall. I have fought my last fight. The victory may go to whosoever desires it.' On this she wept. I could not bear that she should suffer from my misery, and so— Guarding carefully her injured arm, I drew her close to me. And then, out of the darkness of the night, far over the solitude of the sea, there came to us the sound of a voice. That voice was a woman's wail. The girl beside me shuddered and drew back. I did not ask her if she had heard. I knew she had heard. We arose and stood apart without any explanation. From that moment a caress would have been a sacrilege. I did not hear that weird sound again, nor aught else for an hour or more save the bursting of the breakers on the crags of Java. I kept no record of the commonplaces of our voyage thereafter. It only remains for me to say that I arrived in England broken in health and bankrupt in fortune. Brand left no money. His formula for the transmutation of metals is unintelligible to me. I can make no use of it. Edith Metford remains my friend. To part utterly after what we had undergone together is beyond our strength. But between us there is a nameless shadow, reminiscent of that awful night in the Arafura Sea, when death came very near to us. And in my ears... There is always the echo of that voice which I heard by the shores of Java when the misty borderland between life and death seemed clear. My story is told. I cannot prove its truth, for there is much in it to which I am the only living witness. I cannot prove whether Herbert Brand was a scientific magician possessed of all the powers he claimed, or merely a mad physicist in charge of a new and terrible explosive nor whether Edward Gray ever started for Labrador. The burden of the proof of this last must be borne by others, unless it be left to Gray himself to show whether my evidence is false or true. If it be left to him, a few years will decide the issue. I am content to wait. The End End of Chapter 20 Read by Roger Moline End of The Crack of Doom by Robert Cromie